on This Week in Tech. The Silk Road gets shut down, Adobe and Microsoft get owned, IKEA sells a solar oost, and yes, we've got spinning cubes of death. Coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 426, recorded October 6, 2013. Solar Umla. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Audible.com. Sign up for the Platinum Plan and get two free books. Go to audible.com slash twit2. Follow Audible on Twitter, user ID, audible underscore com. And by Shutterstock.com. With over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TWIT1013. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TWIT10. And by Go to Meeting with HD Faces by Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with coworkers and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even present from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code TWIT. This is TWIT, This Week in Tech. It's the show where we take the tech news of the week, push it together in high pressures until there's like a big bang explosion and boom, we've got a golden iPhone. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, in for Leo Laporte, who's on his way back from a well-deserved vacation. But I didn't come alone. My big bang panel starts with Mr. Patrick Norton next to me in studio. Patrick, <laughs> the star of Techzilla, and uh, this week in computer hardware here on the TWIT TV network. Patrick, thank you for making the drive all the way up here. My pleasure. It's, it's, you know, what, what are you working on recently? I saw you pulling up, and it's, it looked like you were moving someone's sofa. Uh, that's actually a small sofa for the reading area, for the library, for my son's school that my wife is building. So sort of dad stuff. Dad stuff. You are such a dad. Yeah. I am a dad. You know who else <laughs> is a dad? Mr. Brian Brushwood, the man, the myth, the legend, the scam meister who eats out? fire. Yeah, and, and I try to keep all of this a secret from you. You're just you're just outing me. Now people will know I had sex once, that, maybe three times. <laughs> now that well, yes, well, <laughs> we have it on tape. No, but seriously, what we do have is you in in some sort of hotel room. Tell us where are you right now? Uh, I am down in Los Angeles. I actually just did a a, a three day. Um, I was asked to give two lectures and perform a live stage show. Uh, at this intensive from uh, that's hosted by Neil Strauss, the guy who wrote The Game, the New York Times bestselling book about the pickup artist community. He's got this whole thing on life hacking that he was doing that I got to talk about. Um, as a matter of fact, today, I just got to learn a brand new way to escape from zip ties or from duct tape that I had never seen before. It was really awesome. Any knowledge that you could pass on to the <laughs> studio audience, which may at one point or another be tied in zip ties? I totally will. Uh, on an upcoming episode of Scam School. Watch oh, for that. <laughs> you got to tease. There, there's a professional, gentlemen. There's a professional. You know who else is joining us? Another consummate professional and a good friend of the show, Mr. Patrick Beja. Patrick, thank you for coming in. What? Wait, what time is it over there? It is uh, 17 minutes past midnight, so it's past my be bedtime by about two hours, you know. I try so to. <laughs> we should be ending right about the time that you should be waking up. Exactly. That's what I usually aim for when I come on Twit. And it's always a, an immense pleasure, so it works out. Well, there we go. That's your panel, the die is cast. Let's get right into it. We've got, I think, the, I, I think we can all agree, the biggest story of the past week was the busting of Silk Road. Now, this was a website in, the, in sort of the dark net, the gray, seedy area of the Internet that you could only access through the Tor network. For those who don't know what the Tor network is, Think of it as, uh, well, an onion. That's what Tor is, the onion router. Right. That allows you to gain anonymity because as your packets pass from one router to the next, they only know the next router that they're going to. It's a, it's a nice way to sort of guarantee that someone can't track back your actual IP address. 
Well, we covered a little bit about the tour network not too long ago and how it had been compromised by the federal government. So I guess it was only a matter of time before they busted the biggest website in this dark net, and that was the Silk Road. Now, Silk Road, for those who, again, maybe haven't been jumping around on the Tor network, was sort of a clearinghouse for things illegal on the internet. You could buy narcotics, you could buy card swipes, you could pretty much sell and trade anything using Bitcoin. Now, Patrick, uh, I'd like to point out that my, my co-host on, on Texel and AC Nation, Robert Heron, bought Twinkies using Bitcoins. <laughs> Uh, on on uh, on the Silk Road, right? So, so it doesn't all have to be illegal. In fact, I I will also admit I've dabbled a little bit in uh, Tor, a little bit in the Silk Road, just to see what you could have sent to your house. Patrick <laughs> or uh, Schwood, have have either of you ever played with Silk Road at all? No, uh, Good well, Lord, I thought no. you were going to say Bitcoin, but then you go straight to Silk Road, and the answer is <laughs> hell's no. <laughs> uh, but I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by. Uh, like Silk Road sort of rose to prominence by by having a best practices for uh, anonymity to, to protect everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways, the shutting down, and of course, there's horrific stuff on Silk Road. You know, everything from, on, you know, from, you could buy pornography, you could contract killings, you could have drugs. Uh, it, uh, people were selling uh, fraudulent uh, uh, IDs uh, that they would ship over. Nobody's defending what was sold on Silk Road. But I wonder if one of the things that's happening is is there's a lot of talk about how the federal government was able to uh, was able to take down Silk Road, and I wonder if all that's going to generate is another layer of best practices for underground transfer of materials. In many ways, uh, isn't us reading about the takedown of this just setting the stage for the next uh, thing to, to 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 take its place? Uh, not not unlike the Dread Pirate Roberts itself. Right. Well, let, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, oh sorry. First, Patrick, uh, you oh, not Patrick. I'm sorry. We've got two Patricks on the show, so you have to be not Patrick. You wanted to well, say something? Yeah. It's my Twitter handle, so yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the really, there are two really interesting things, I think, uh, uh, that, that we heard uh, in this story. First of all, you mentioned that they, the, the government sort of broke uh, into the Tor uh, network. And in the case of Silk Road, at least, they didn't actually use any, you know, they didn't break into that to get the identity right. of the guy. They actually used uh, pretty standard, uh, if you want to boil it down to to what it uh, it, it it comes to it's a web search they found the guy through a, a forums it was on stack overflow i think where he made a rookie mistake posting mm -hmm. with his name mm -hmm. for one minute and then changing it to his uh, to his uh, nickname um so the the anonymity of tor from what i understand and and silk road is kind of still uh, intact and the other thing is you were talking about the fact that we can use um we could by uh, really trivial things on Silk Road as well. Now, I personally never went there, um, but a, a lot of uh, what we're hearing from, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, uh, Ulbrich. Um, right, right, Ross. He, he, he has, uh, exactly, yeah. So he has some uh, ideological, uh, at least the excuses he's giving are somewhat ide ideological. He wants to create a, an anarchist experiment slash uh, uh, utopia with with this tool now of course there are things that contradict this this ideology in the way he acts but from what he's saying it isn't intrinsically uh destined to be uh, uh, uh used by Ill for illegal activities right um, i i think there's actually a really good comparison here between mm -hmm. tor and torrents by the way the, the two are not the same for anyone who might be wondering about that in that people just associate torrents with illegal stuff with movies but right. there are perfectly legitimate uses for a very good technology like torrents same thing goes for the onion router uh, for, for that anonymity network it could be used for many good things, protecting dissidents in countries that are monitoring the Internet, uh, for making sure that your transactions aren't being monitored by a third party. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, the, the same sort of security that's baked into Tor has been emulated by several right. perfect, perfectly legitimate security vendors. So, you know, I, I hope that this is not that moment where people just assume anyone running right. Tor must be a criminal. Patrick? No, it, it's not. And it's what, what's funny about this is is um, not to flog the, not to get anything started about the NSA, but the NSA hates Tor because Tor is a wicked ripping pain in the ass to crack and they don't have much success with it. Um, so there's some of the documents that have been released recently point out that these sort of 
the irritation that Tor brings to the NSA. Um, Even though, ironically, the uh, the federal government finances, what is it, like 60% of, of Tor because they want to have a protected way for dissidents <laughs> and for journalists to be able to report from uh, within regimes overseas. But, yeah. Brian, those are the good dissidents, Brian, yeah. right? I mean, the good ones. We want those. Don't even get that conversation started with this crew. <laughs> but what's funny, though, is, 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 is you know, the Ars Technica had a really good article on this, and, and one of the things they do is this was playing old-fashioned police work on a large scale with the FBI with a lot of subpoenas where they basically found you know one of the first mentions and who you know the one of the first mentions was from Altoid on a site about mushrooms and they referred a WordPress blog and that had been created and they worked their way they worked the case mm -hmm. um, this wasn't a case of uh, this this is like classic hard police work and it's kind of funny that this guy uh, the Dread Private Roberts, uh, 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 you know, Uldrich, who was like very peace, love and understanding and against force was like, somebody's trying to blackmail my clients. I'm going to call a hit out on them, which is, this is really, it's, that's old that's school, exactly North happened, Jersey, yeah. lower Manhattan death. He paid right? $80,000 so, to hire a hit man to take out a former associate. And, um, and, you know, and the FBI did an old fashioned sting. They had someone pose as a hitman. Mm -hmm. He transferred $80,000 in Bitcoins. Boom, they had their proof and they went in, it, in to make the bust. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. There, this story, unfortunately, will be seen by some as, oh, well, the Tor network is now insecure. The Tor network is forever doomed. I don't think so. They, they didn't break the Tor network mm -hmm. to make this work. In fact, there was a, uh, a bust not too long ago uh, the, dealing with freedom hosting ISP where people assumed that the government had taken over a layer of the Tor network to find the identities of people who were <laughs> trading in kiddie porn. That wasn't the case. What they had done was they had hacked the servers that they were accessing and they installed malware, which infected the people who yeah. were visiting. It's not quite old-fashioned police work, but it's the same sort of thing. They didn't bust the mechanism. Right. They busted the person on the other side of the screen. Now, my okay. question to, to Patrick, to, to not Patrick, is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Does that mean anything? Is that that fine line? I mean, to, to say, look, the government did their job. They didn't violate what we think is the inalienable right to be anonymous on the Internet, but they did get some bad people. Well, it's it's definitely good that they got the guys they were looking for. And I think it's also very good that they didn't uh, either manage or need to uh, crack Tor as a network, mm -hmm. because first of all, it would have validated probably, uh, you know, more um, uh, surveillance somehow, we, you know, with, with everything we've been talking about for a few months, uh, the ability to crack something, uh, defeat some, uh, some anonymi anonymization uh, uh, system would have put more strength in the, the fact that they would need uh, more of these kinds of tools. Uh, thankfully, they didn't manage to do that or they didn't need to do it. Uh, it's also interesting that they're being, maybe not quiet, but I mean, we're not hearing so much that, look, this is just good police work. And I think that should be pointed out a little bit more. Now, to come back to, to what you were saying earlier, you're saying that Tor is being viewed in a, you know, with this suspect kind of people who use Tor must be doing something bad. I personally haven't seen that all that much. Silk Road, definitely. But Tor is still sort of in that neutral gray mm -hmm. area of this is a tool and some people will use it for good stuff, some people for bad stuff. Is that something that you guys are seeing in the US that Tor is now suspect? Man, I got to be honest, like Tor is so sort of... Um Underground. I mean, even here yeah. among the Twit audience, we're having to explain what what Tor is to a lot of people. That's how that's how fringe and underground it is. I don't know that it really has a reputation that can be affected one way or the other. But one thing, one parallel that I'd like to explore is uh, in the days of of you know using air quotes here, stealing music. Uh, Napster ran ran supreme and uh, was the central hub by which everybody you know uh, dealt with their music or got their illegal downloads. Uh, and then once Napster went away, you saw an increase in the anonymity side of thing. You saw distributed hosting with uh, with BitTorrent, and that became the way people started to, to share all their stuff. Uh, right now, if there's one person you don't want to be right now, it's a client of Silk Road because all the servers have been nabbed by the federal government. They're, they have all kinds of information that they're going to use to track down people, whether it's, you know, people offering fraudulent whatevers or drugs or whatever. Like, all this crap is going to roll downhill. The head has been cut off of this beast, and now they're going to feast on the innards of all these <laughs> lower-level criminals. 
uh, are we going to see the same thing again where now all of a sudden the next structure will induce or, or create some kind of double blindness to where uh, – because that's probably right now if you're somebody who wants to sell – you know, meth or cocaine or whatever, uh, and you go to Silk Road, you you trust the reputation of Silk Road to be uh, this repository that's above reproach, and now you've seen that's not the case. Uh, I would imagine that that future clients of whatever takes its place will want some kind of uh, some kind of uh, security on their end that they won't be able to, even if they get taken down, that they're not going to be found out. You know, interesting security note here. We have been so focused on the transport layer, the, the pipe that takes data from one point to another. Mm -hmm. That has to be encrypted. That has to be protected. How dare the NSA spy on that? That we kind of forget that eventually that data ends up stored on a physical hard drive somewhere. Right. And if that physical hard drive gets confiscated and if it hasn't been encrypted, that it doesn't matter how well you encrypt your transport layer, your data <laughs> is there for the taking. Well, it also helps, like, one of the reasons servers are located in certain countries and they get routed access to a server, you might have three or four jumps between the public and that server so that if someone does come after you legally, then they have to go through some of the most privacy-sensitive privacy courts or countries and fight their way through that to get the location of the actual servers and then get to that server. They have to fight with that country that the server's located in. And then hopefully you've been smart enough to encrypt all of that data, but... But, um, you know, there, there's a reason why th there's a there's there's a reason why, say, Twitter and not a Tor network was used during, you know, sort of the Egyptian revolutions because it's easily accessible. You know, you can dump accounts, you can dump cell phones, um, you know, but mostly because it was just it was not really complicated to set up and setting up Tor and servers and encryption and doing all of this is really hard. In fact, the guy that set up the Silk Road basically didn't follow his own advice and left too much information around. Right. Um, Actually, did you did you hear? Apparently, the um, the guy who got arrested might not be the original Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, <laughs> he, it seems like well, what he's saying at least is I I'm not the one who set this up. The guy did it and then bestowed upon me the title and you know that title will be bestowed upon someone else yeah, I, I heard that the guy he got it from actually wasn't the original dread pirate roberts either every night okay. before i went to bed he said good work i'll most likely kill you in the morning and then one day <laughs> you know you know patrick all i can say is as you wish oh man but, okay there is another angle to the story that i would like to take and it does more look at law enforcement uh, because no matter how we feel yes there there is a level of law enforcement that we we want to see on the internet we want to see with ventures like this because obviously silk robe was not above board obviously they were using tor to hide some pretty shady dealings but then there are those who will point to this and say see this is why the nsa needs to have back doors into encryption this is why the fbi needs to be able to have back doors into our data centers and uh, so I, I think I want to start this off with Schwood. Schwood, I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I'm not doing anything wrong, well, I shouldn't fear, right? I should be totally oh my fine God. with this. What is, what is, you are fishing with the stinkiest bait of all time. What is this? <laughs> uh, look, here's the thing. And I, I almost wonder if, if the, you know, the timing of this stuff, uh, who is to say if it was just the right time to take someone down? But, but I would imagine, if I was on the outside looking in, I would imagine that in the last, say, two or three months, uh, the popularity and the interest in browsers like Tor has gone through the roof because we're hearing story after right. story of every kind of compromised thing, the NSA poking their face all over the place. Uh, I would imagine that now would be a very good time, and I would imagine that internally there would be a lot of pressure to show a win for defeating the bad guys by taking down somebody from behind a, an otherwise secure thing. Uh, 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 no, there's no case to be made that the NSA needs a backdoor. If anything, this is in every way a validation for, as you put it, traditional police work, where you have people who know somebody who somebody makes a mistake and you take them down. And it was all done without breaking encryption. So if anything, this is the evidence that, that we don't need any backdoors. <laughs> Breathe. Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. Cleanse. Cleanse. Let it go. I'm fine. It's Fine, okay. we're all good here. Okay. <laughs> now, not Patrick, you can give us the uh, the non-US-centric look at this. What do you think about a government agency coming to you as a citizen and saying, look, we, we need help. Old-fashioned police work isn't going to cut it in this century. We need a way to look at these supposedly secure communications, but we promise, we promise we're only going to look at the bad guys. 
Um, yeah, so that's the trick question, isn't it? I mean, if, if you want to go really uh, uh, first layer, then this is exactly what 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 Schwood said. Um, you actually didn't need it in this case, so bad example. If you want to go really deep and philosophical, I think we've discussed this a, a million times, but I've never heard anyone actually explain why that 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 question that you're asking is invalid. Why people saying, you know, we're just going to use it to catch the bad guys, or we we just need to observe everything. And the reason is, everyone says, you know, it has to do with freedom. It has to, but we don't have the actual explanation. The reason is. If you are being observed, think of think of your home. If you know that you're being observed in your home, then you are going to be acting differently. When you're being observed, you're not being completely free to act as you want. That means that your freedom is restricted when you're being observed, when you don't have somewhere, some space of privacy for yourself. So your freedom is actually being, I can't believe I'm saying this, but is actually being attacked when you don't have a space to, to be completely private, to be completely your own. And it doesn't matter that it's in the physical space or that it is in the virtual, you know, internet space. Now, if, if you want me to tell you about the, the outside of the U.S. perspective, it's that you guys act in the U.S., I say, you know, I generalize, uh, you guys don't really care about people outside of the US. The whole debate that you guys have been having is, are we allowed to spy on American citizens or not? The, the, the outside of the US question is kind of settled. So we're not so happy about that. And me personally, <laughs> I would like to, you know, I would like the, 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 the question to be, are you allowed to spy on everyone in general, not just people in the US? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't listening, not Patrick, because you're not from the U.S. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, well, and keep in mind, like, uh, uh, Patrick Beja is 100% right. You like, like the, the NSA was founded on the idea, like, it, the whole thing that made my entire youth growing up, you know, we knew about the NSA. We knew they listened to phone calls, but it was always international phone calls. We had this this bizarre fig leaf that, like, as long it as was it was always an international them, phone call, it was us. the other and not us. Right, correct. Uh, and it's 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 astonishing to me that it's suddenly an issue because because we know that they're watching us. They were always watching us. It was it, it was it was a false dichotomy to begin with. And I, I am hoping that if anything good can come of the horrific realizations that we have, is that maybe uh, maybe in an age where we are seeing the twilight of true privacy, we can establish uh, robust methods to to bring that back. The idea that you could say something or be someone in one place and be someone someone totally different in another place you know there's all kinds of extraordinarily legitimate reasons for this because uh as as many people have said before me uh you don't need freedom to say something smart and you certainly don't need freedom to say something popular you need freedom and you need the protections of freedom in order to say something unpopular outrageous ridiculous or crazy uh, which time and time again, we see that many of the most important ideas in the human race come from the fringes who say outrageous, stupid things from the outside well, that wait, otherwise wait, wait know, minute, they couldn't say in polite society. The twilight of true privacy. I, I, I got to ask, what makes you think we're heading towards that? Uh, well, the fact that we all sparkle in the sunlight now and that uh, doughy-eyed chicks keep watching us play baseball. Well, it happens to me anyways, but you know, it's, it's cool. It's cool. No, but, but honestly, my stand has always been if you actually understand how the internet works, if you actually understand how networking works, if you are accessing a server at in any other part of the world, I don't care if it's in the United States or in another country, you have to assume that your traffic is being intercepted. It's just so easy to do it yeah. in a modern network. So, okay, no, and and that is that is that is correct today. But there is no reason, Father, that we can't create structures that are robust that that anonymize traffic. We can create privacy only if we as a society decide that it's okay for us to live, thrive, and survive in a world where somebody cannot know something. And that's something right now, we're, we, we are at the dawn of this era of sharing, and we all are fascinated with the fact that we could tweet out photos of our breakfasts, uh, but but we are we are losing something. And I think stories like this make us realize that 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 maybe there's a value to, uh, to a segregation of different parts of our lives. These firewalls between our public and private lives, I think is important. 
and I'm hoping that 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 we will decide as a society to create more structures that make that possible. Okay, let's let's go off the rails completely. There, there was a story this last week about how Google is trying to implement sort of a true authentication system. Mm -hmm. They want it tied to your Google Plus account when you're commenting on YouTube because their belief is if people have to use their real identities that we would reduce the, the amount of trolls. We would reduce the amount of online bullying. If we did head into a society where there was a guarantee of true anonymity, how do we then defend against the trolls? Well, there's... No, no, okay, what, what it's not one or the other. It's not. Yeah. I mean, you can you can have different you know uses for different cases. You can have it. It, it doesn't have to be everyone is you know absolutely an anonymous or everyone is absolutely you know using their real name because in both cases you're going to have problems. And I would like to disagree with something that you you both said, uh, Padre and and Brian. Uh, Brian, you said that we didn't have people were listening all the time before, and that was we knew it and. You you know, it's always been the case. It's not true. It, it hasn't been the case. We well, hold, hold on, hold on. Not Patrick. There's, there's what what Padre said is that packets have always been exposed on the internet, and any server in yeah. between hither and yon can can make sure. a copy of those packets no, or look at them. That's the, what that's what what Brian was saying. Yeah, uh, he was saying that you know the NSA would listen to you, and you know, but what 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 Padre said was anyone could be listening to you. I, I mean, at least that's. I think what you mean, it's true that information on the internet is theoretically available to pretty much anyone. But there's a difference between that and the government looking at all of it. It's like yeah. you're walking down the street and you know that someone could be looking at you. But it's different in every street and every city in the country is layered with cameras that are looking at you and analyzing what mm -hmm. you do all the time. I'm not saying, you know, one is better th or the, than the other. I have my opinion on this, but it's irrelevant here. <laughs> I'm just saying it is a different thing, and you can't equate them both. Every, well, you know, all the information being available for anyone to potentially observe on the internet is different from the NSA having arrays of servers yeah. looking at and analyzing everything. And, and I, I completely agree with that. It's also amazing, like Bruce Schneier did a great article for The Guardian where he points out the NSA has inserted all these exploits into services. And it's like Snowden basically went out and said, yo, world, and, and the United States went, oh, and the rest of the world went, oh, God. And... But what that means is that all of these services that thought they were relatively secure have found out in many cases there's just big old giant holes walking in or have, you know, have basically have been publicly exposed that they were compelled to, to do things that are kind of curious and, and, and unpleasant. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, it undermines trust. There's obviously undermined trust in the U.S. Um, the fact that all of this information, I agree with, with not Patrick, all this information being warehoused is incredibly creepy um, and incredibly unsettling, especially, you know, all you got to do is go back to Nixon, who is tasking the FBI to dig up information on his enemies list. It was like 600 or 800 people long and targeting the FBI to generate information that could be used against his political enemies. This is scary stuff. This is like, you know, for, you know less than 40, 40, 45 years ago in the United States. This is a big deal. And I don't want to take anything against the people that work at the NSA because I've met some of them. They seem to be fine people. And I would love for terrorism to be stopped. And I believe in signals intelligence. But at some point, it gets out of hand. You know, the, you know, so I'll. If, 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 if I can, let, let, let me <laughs> move things back to uh, Padre SJ's question, which was uh, how does this tie in <laughs> with the, the movement towards real identi uh, identities on YouTube right. using Google Plus for the comments? Uh, in no way does that shift actually reveal true identities. Instead, what it does is it creates an environment where your reputation matters. If your reputation is this particular identity, you can have five different identities. You can have five different names and you can create backstories for all of them and, and histories and you can comment on each of them. But it will, but the ability to hide behind an anonymous brand new name and be given the exact same weight as somebody who has commented and been upvoted hundreds of times beforehand, uh, the, the, the fact that that false equality is no longer under the new system, uh, that is significant. You can still, nobody will ever know who you are. You can live your life as a banker and then, and, and, you know, uh, leave comments as a, as a, you know, a, a transsexual prostitute or whatever. And, but as long as you create that <laughs> Brian, persistent have reality. Brian, spying on me again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, wait. We got to go to an ad, but before that, I do want to tackle one little addendum to this. And that is, if there w could be a way to create an online identity, 
that's completely anonymous. Let, let, it's, it's a third party that we trust that ties it to your real name so we can guarantee that you only have one of these. That is your online identity. It cannot be tracked back to you, but you have to now protect it. You can't just say ridiculous trollish stuff on the internet because that actually affects your reputation. Would that be acceptable to both the people who want accountability and the people who want privacy? Patrick. Well, it still won't interrupt the fact that some people are scum or some people have no filter or some people are just sacks of evil with keyboards and they will say nasty things even if we know who they are. The second thing is there will never be a third party or a first party that will be able to eliminate all people spoofing identities and creating fake identities on the internet, even right. Google. Right. Right. Hmm. Now, the, the solution th is clearly uh, we can look to World of Warcraft because there are characters. <laughs> there's, there is there uh, is when I play an MMO, I have my favorite character who I, I want to to do best practices on to get farthest ahead possible. If I want to do something stupid, I make a brand new level one character and then do something stupid because that's a disposable character. What the level one character does has a smaller impact in that world than what the level 60 character does. And likewise, that's the way it should be with comments. You in comments, a, a brand new account with no backstory should have a lower ability to impact the world around them with what he has to say, unless unless what he has to say is voted up, uh, you know, Reddit style and makes an impact on the community by the sheer merit of what it has to say. But the ability to, to, to fling poo at a wall should not be equal to to a real verified ID versus a brand new made one, and this is their first comment. You know, only it's, if we had someone who worked for Blizzard. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Absolutely no comment on that. Okay. Uh, however, I will say I will say two things. First of all, it's very surprising that uh, it took so long. Actually, the surprising thing is that it took so long for Google to implement that in YouTube. It's been an issue for a long time, uh, and I, I think that the normal situation is that the, the 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 comments are a little bit more tied to an identity uh you know than it currently is um the other thing is actually we should probably try and get someone from korea from south korea to to discuss this topic because if i'm not mistaken they have this exact system that you were talking about uh, padre they have a unique identifier per person that every service on the web has has to use to identify someone. Um, and so basically, there is no way to hide. It's not even that they can have multiple identities. They can only have their own identity, including forums and, you know, any service on the web. I'm sure there are ways to circumvent that, but that's the way the system is designed. So it would be pretty interesting to have someone from there uh, tell us about it. Absolutely. Now, guys, I, I know we could go on forever about this topic, but I'm, you know, I'm going to call a halt to it. We're going to come back briefly to talk about just a little bit of a tangent. But before we do that, I want to take time to talk about our first sponsor, and that's Audible. You see, this, this episode of Twit was sponsored by Audible.com. I, I remember when the first time I listened to Audible, I didn't quite get it. I didn't understand why I'd want to be listening to books, and it wasn't until I actually got busy that I realized, yeah, this, this is a really good way to catch up on, on the books, on the titles, on the literature that people tell me I should be big on. Just this last week, I was on my way over to New York. I knew I had a five-hour flight. I knew it was going to be a red eye. I, I, I don't sleep on planes all that well. So I called back an old faithful favorite and uh, listened to it in audio form. I had already read it, but I listened to Ready Player One. I, I, have you read that book? I have yeah. read that book. I, I, it's one of those books I desperately want turned into a movie. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, it was actually narrated by Will Wheaton, which was a wonderful thing because I'm hearing Will Wheaton in my head and I'm picturing everything that's going on in the book and suddenly the Starship Enterprise shows up. No, no, that didn't happen. But <laughs> it is a really good way to catch up on those books that you've always wanted to read, but you just didn't have the time for it. Now, you see, for those who want to give Audible a try, we have a wonderful chance here at Twit to, to, to give you the gift of reading. You see, you could sign up for their platinum plan using our code, and that gives you two free audiobooks to try out and two book credits per month. That comes every month. You choose your books, you load them up, and you listen to them when you can, during your commute, during your jog, during your walk, during your private times in the office or at home. It's a great deal for people who enjoy listening to audio programming. And as with other plans, you also get a free subscription to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times Daily Audio Programs. That's all included in your Platinum subscription. Now, you know, for more details and to get two free audiobooks about their Platinum offer, I'd like you to go to audible.com slash twit2. 
That's audible.com slash twit, the number two, and see if maybe Audible might be the thing that you're missing in your literary life. That's audible.com slash twit, two. And we thank Audible for their support of This Week in Tech. Slightly a different story, but still kind of connected to Silk Road is all about Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been in the news recently, and never more so than when they busted Silk Road and realized that they just took a big chunk of the Bitcoins available in the world out of circulation. Now, let's, let's have a little bit of a historical uh, love fest about Bitcoin. It was <laughs> first introduced for trading on December 30th, 2010. They started trading at about 30 cents per Bitcoin, and not, not all that promising. Now... The Dread Pirate Roberts posted about Bitcoin on his blog on January 27, 2011. And just a few days later, Bitcoin was at parity with the U.S. dollar. So there is a tie-in between Silk Road and Bitcoin. It was really one of the first places that showed people that there was a market for Bitcoins and there was a place to use it. Now, on June 7th of this year, Bitcoin hit $30 per Bitcoin. Uh, remember that there was that big chunk of news during the cycle where people were trying to farm Bitcoins because they had become the new market. And mm -hmm. especially when the dollar was weak, it was it seemed like a good investment. Uh, with the, with the uh, takedown of Silk Road, we saw Bitcoin value kind of plummet a little bit and, and, and recover slightly. But all of this points to Bitcoin actually being a real currency. It's acting like a currency should act, right? I mean, this is what you would expect from a currency that's not make-believe, that's not just right. there, but... It reacts to world conditions. It reacts to the demand for the currency. Does does this the busting of Silk Road verify that yes, Bitcoin is a real currency that should that will continue? Well, the FBI is. So, oh, oh, Patrick first. Oh, I was, I was uh, yo, go ahead, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny. Uh, there's an article on Forbes. It says so they seized about twenty six thousand bitcoins. The mm -hmm. thing is, that's not the 600,000 Bitcoins that actually belong to uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts, which is apparently about 5% of all the Bitcoin currently in existence. But what it does say is the FBI was like, we're going to hold on to them until after the legal. Basically, they're going to hold on to them through the prosecution, the trial, whatever happens, and then, quote, we will probably just liquidate them. So whether or not you believe it's a legitimate currency, it's certainly being treated by the FBI as a legitimate uh, commodity to be sold uh, for the maximum bid. So they, the FBI, at least, wants the price of Bitcoins to stay high uh, for the foreseeable future. Right, right. I, I'm so, Sherwood, I, I think you were going to jump in with some Bitcoin goodness. Uh, well, yeah, specifically, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, it, Bitcoin has a reputation of being like, oh, that's what you'd use to buy drugs or do illegal bull stuff. Uh, the the question that is fascinating to me is that we, we saw, what, a 15% drop, right? right. Uh, essentially, the hub of all the dirtiest, filthiest, most Bitcoin-associated uh, malfeasance was shut down all at once, and it only affected the Bitcoin economy 15%. Can you right. imagine? I mean, what, what would happen to, 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 to the Chinese Yuan if, if all of online piracy in China were shut down overnight? I, I would suspect that there would be more than a 15% uh, effect on that. Right. Or what would happen to the U.S. dollar if Apple just got seized by the U.S. government? Yeah, yeah sure, We're talking sure. about the so, same so, sort of effect. That was the big player in the Bitcoin community. And uh, yeah, I think, Patrick, you're absolutely right. The fact that the FBI is holding on to it they understand that it's worth something. It's, right. it's not just a virtual number that they can get rid of because it's going to go away after the seizure. They see that, yeah, this is something that people have traded. It has value even though it only exists in a computer. You know, it's kind of funny. The, 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 the general, depending on whether you refer to the Silk Road in terms of the number of Bitcoins processed or the actual value, but the, the, the number being bandied about in U.S. dollars right now is like $1.2 billion in trade, yielding like $80 million in profit um, for for. Uh, Ulbricht. And it's kind of funny to think about that is, is you know, it'll be curious, I think, uh, Schwood, looking forward over the next six to 10 weeks, um, because right now, okay, there was a hit, there was a temporary hit, there was a panic, people started to sell them off. <gasps> I've got a Bitcoin, I have to sell them before my mom finds them, right? Because my mom's going to think I'm buying drugs. Um, but what's kind of interesting is like, what's going to happen at this point is, will there be an ongoing market, right? Because 5% of the Bitcoins on the planet, uh, 
you know, it, it, the FBI is trying to find that wallet. Once the FBI finds that wallet, they own like one in every 20 Bitcoins. But that still means the vast majority of Bitcoins were circulating back and forth, right? Doing what currency is supposed to do in a healthy economy. So the $64,000 question is, will the value of those continue to rise uh, because there are other avenues for exchange for the Bitcoins? Or will it turn out to, that this was like where all of the Bitcoins were traveling? There's a, Does that make sense? Because I can't speak economists no, I, without I sounding it. like an idiot. I got it. But there, um, there's also a story attached to that, and that is there are many users of Silk Road who are now complaining that, well, they're out. They're out tremendous sums of money because the way that it works is you have to deposit your <coughs> Bitcoins, well, it, the way it used to work, into Silk Road, and then you could actually make a transaction. You could make that trade. You could make that buy. You could make a sale. And there are people who are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I had $10,000 in Bitcoins in Silk Road. I, you can't prove I did anything illegal. How could you just take that away from me? Well, it depends uh, on. Well, I'm sure. I mean, they'll, I mean, look, they'll, like it's, you know, it's like you, you you bought you bought credits. You bought credits in a fantasy world where you'd get drugs and pedophile files, and now those credits are gone. They were gone the moment you spent it, and the fact that the company shut down before you got a chance to spend them. Look, man, if World of Warcraft went away, I'm sorry, not Patrick. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say I bought all this gold. And where's my value? <laughs> I'd understand that the company's gone. I, I, I don't really think it's the same thing. I think yeah. if if the U.S. is, you know, interested in, well, let's even put aside the fact that they, you know, the, the, the agency wants to sell them back once the, the prosecution has concluded. I'm sh half sure that they will have a phone number. And if you want to get your Bitcoins back and, you know, you can call up the phone number, say, this is what I use them for. Here are the records. And please give them back and i'm sure they will be happy to give you to give them back of course i'm also pretty certain that no one is ever going to do that but it is if it is considered real value that i and i believe it is uh i'm sure the us can you know the the, the agency can give it back but but would they i mean that i think that would be a Why ultimate not? test of this as a currency yeah. if if this was an operation that was doing things illegally, uh, say a bank that was also doing a Ponzi scheme, the U.S. federal government would be absolutely honor-bound, law-bound, to try to get back money to the victims of the scheme, maybe people who were unwittingly using the service. Will they do the same thing with Bitcoin, knowing that it's, it's not U.S. currency, it's not any nationally recognized currency, but it's Bitcoin? I think... That, that's when, you know, it may act like a real currency, but until it can receive the same sort of legal protections as a currency, it, is it actually a currency? But, but is, well, and even if it's not a currency, even if it's not a currency, it's property, isn't it? It's something that yeah. those people own. So if, you know, they're just, they just happen to bust a warehouse right. where a bunch of stuff was stored. There was some drugs, some, you know, questionable material and some Twinkies. And, you know, after they've cleared the Twinkies, I'm sure they can give them back to <laughs> their owners. Or either that or, you know, they start paying government workers and uh, in, in Bitcoins. Let, let, let me go devil's there. advocate. Let me go. And, and I don't actually believe this, but I, I want to stoke the fire a little bit. Is it actual property? It's, it's, it's entirely yes. virtual. When we think of cash and the reason why we, we can move around numbers on a computer and think that, yes, that's my cash is because it actually has its root in a physical object. Bitcoin has no roots in a physical object. They Neither, turned it into a physical object. But but the entire stock market is a, is a is a is a is a hallucination. Checks. I write a check to you. That's an agreement. That's an honor bound thing. That's not a physical object. It's a promise to pay. Right. The, the money in your pocket is a consensual hallucination. Bitcoin ticker available on Bloomberg terminal for employees. Right. right. XBT. If Bloomberg's recognizing it, if a federal judge has ruled that Bitcoin is real money, um, you know, then it is a means of 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 exchange and a means of trade the thing is, is is like not patrick was saying look if i stored my boat you know at you know abel baker charlie storage facility and it turned out that baker was making meth with charlie and abel was selling it and the entire thing had the fbi swoop down on it and roll everybody up and all of the stuff would be locked up for an x amount of time you know and then eventually at some point they would say hey if you stored your boat here let us know we'll let you get your boat back and i do it through the process to to get my boat back what, what i'm waiting for in this story is some you know nice young man or woman is going to be like i want my bitcoins back and they're not going to think about the fact that they want their bitcoins back but now the federal government now has the entire list of trades they did where they were shipping you know meth or shrooms or weed or whatever they were selling that was not a a, a legal thing and at some point there's going to be this 
rush of stories where stoned idiots ask the FBI <laughs> to give them back the money they made for selling shrooms. All right? It's sad, well, but it's going to happen. Yeah, of course, that's that's why I was saying, you know, probably no one is going to actually go in and request their bitcoins. But th there's also another thing. It, you were pointing out, Patrick, that, that they want to sell them at the end. Mm -hmm. And they can't both say that it's not real and we can't give it back to you and then turn around and sell them. It's I, one or the other. I love that. And okay. I think they want that's, to and also, sell the remains, Also, like, right? like, like the, discussion, the discussion started uh, moments ago with, with saying like the government is treating right. Bitcoins like real money. Uh, it doesn't seem, and I don't know how much of this is, you know, one hand not knowing what the other one's up to, but if the government treats Bitcoins as real currency, then you have enormous tax implications. And then, uh, and if Bitcoins are real money, then why isn't World of Warcraft gold real money? There's a, there's an actual exchange. And, and at this point, like at what point do, does somebody go to jail for stealing a sword with a Ponzi scheme in game? You know, on the flip right. side, you have stuff like EVE Online, it has a game structure where people perform real fraudulent activities against other people that defraud them of real value uh, ISK in the game, but it's shrugged off as being part of the game experience. Uh, what is the difference between Bitcoin and ISK? They both have exchange rates. They're both manipulated. They're both traded. Uh, who is to say is the U.S. government the one in charge of deciding nobody's, what's a real com currency? Nobody's, and is, nobody, least of all me, is saying the U.S. government is in charge of deciding what's a real or legitimate security cute emails with somebody in the U.S. government explaining to me why I don't know what I'm talking about. But this is also like, you know, speaking of Audible and long books that are great to listen to, uh, Cryptonomicon, which was Neil Stevenson's incredible book about sort of creating you know, currency and value out of nothing or what defines currency or what defines value. But they were working to create a real encrypted international uh, sort of, you know, internet or code bound currency. And, you know, people for years... You want to learn a lot about the value of money? Spend a lot of time, you know, talking to somebody who grew up in a country where the currency r routinely crashed and turned into something that was less useful than toilet paper because toilet paper was still good for something, but the money wasn't. You know what I mean? And in, in people, right. the, the idea of currency takes a radically different shift depending on where you are in the planet. You know, you know, most of the people in this room, well, all the people in most, everybody, yeah, everybody in this room, most of the people on, on that are live on this podcast, actually all of us, because I don't think there's been a major currency crash in, in France in forever. And the U.S. dollar is the standard of trade. So we've had this very stable currency. So we think like money is the thing in the bank and it's always good. And if I have a dollar, it's good for something. Talk to somebody who grew up in a country where a dollar suddenly became like you know a quarter of a cent or something even less useful that and then other means of exchange become standard you know dollars are a consensual hallucination we all agree that this piece of paper with green ink on it or multicolored ink on it now since we're fancy and have multicolored money like other countries now is something that everybody agreed upon and then everybody agreed that we could use checks and everybody agreed that this weird piece of plastic with a number and I make a phone call and then it gets automated is a way for money to be exchanged or value to be exchanged we we're talking about exchanging value. It's complicated and it's mystical and it's all about the majority of the people or a minority of the people who are important in the scheme buying into it. Um, well, and, and and I guess that's that's in one regard. Uh, Bitcoin is infinitely superior to all other forms of currency <laughs> that come before it and that structurally it encourages uh, forced scarcity that the, the more players you get in the right. market, the more manipulation you try to have. Um, like the very act of trying to mine Bitcoins only makes existing Bitcoins more secure. Uh, and that is astonishing to me. And I, I certainly hope that that whatever happens with the Silk Road story, I hope that that the story of Bitcoins is not shut down or, or affected negatively. Yeah, because I, mean, I think that there's tremendous potential. It's also funny that like, you know, so the original stock market was basically built around people exchanging, you know, subunits of stocks <laughs> or, or shares of the Dutch East India Company. And the idea that there were like little subunits of the Dutch East India Company, which is a sign that I've been reading Neil Stevenson again. But you know what I mean? Like this is this is all this has been happening for like 600 years, man. We're all just back there again or 400 years. Math is hard. But it's it's a, it's a problem that's been solved before. It's a problem that will rise again. And yeah, I'm with you. I'm going to be really curious to see what happens to Bitcoin and if it can become a legitimate means of exchange. And how, you know, what does a sub-Bitcoin turn into? And how do I buy, you know, something that costs $2 worth of Bitcoin when a Bitcoin is worth $132? Because, you know, 500 years ago, you would cut you know your 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 Spanish doubloon or whatever the hell it was into small pieces into bits. Sure. Um, yeah.
You know, they're mentioning now in the chat room that we've spent almost an hour talking about Bitcoin-related stories and uh, drugs and drugs and so and, I, and and hitmen. I think that's actually a, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good show. Yeah, hitmen, drugs, and and bitcoins. But I, I do want to throw one more thing at you, just because I don't think any of you have yet gone on the complete rant. And that is, there are people in the chat room, and thank you very much, Brian, for bringing up the idea of of ISK, you know, in-game currency and the Bitcoin. The one defense that people seem to use most often when trying to separate the U.S. dollar versus Bitcoin or the franc from Bitcoin, the euro from Bitcoin, whatever it might be, is, but the Bitcoin and in-game currency is made up. It's pretend money. It doesn't actually mean anything. And, and when you come down to it, that's really the only argument you can use against a currency like Bitcoin or like in-game currency. Work has gone in to create it. Work has gone in to trade it. Work has gone in, which means it should be worth something. And so we're just saying there's a difference between real in-world currency and digital currency. I, I say there is none and there should be none. And I believe digital currency, I believe Bitcoin is probably, uh, if, if Bitcoin can weather this storm, this reputation storm with Silk Road, then Bitcoin truly is the future. And it's like uh, the, the fact that it's got a structure where the more people try to get it for free, the more people try to manipulate it, the better and more secure it becomes, then then that's that's a future I could live with. Patrick, are you going to, oh, sorry, not Patrick, are you going to trade in your euros for Bitcoins? I No, but I really, really, really wish I had purchased a few Bitcoins a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Patrick, are you going to be buying any of those physical Bitcoins you can actually 3D print? Not at this stage. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe it's here to stay, though. I mean, uh, anecdotally, I've seen a few, you know, uh, developers and, and uh, web designers accepting Bitcoins. And it, it doesn't seem like we've been attacked. Well, not we, but a lot of people have been attacking it and trying to find flaws and trying to see why it wouldn't work. It doesn't seem to be not working. Um, after three years and after that, that uh, issue with Silk Road... It is still around, uh, and as Patrick was saying, is it's, if it's still around in, in six weeks, it, I don't really see how it could go away unless something really unexpected and really catastrophic uh, happens. So maybe I should trade in some euros for bitcoins. I don't know now. I'm confused. I think I'm confused could be the episode title. Now, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to come back. It could be every episode title. Come on, face it, man. Yes. Well, I mean, if we're not confused, we're not doing our jobs. I think that's that's what it comes down to. Really. But you know what's not confusing, Brian? What? Shutterstock. Name one thing, Padre. Name one thing that's not confusing this whole beguiling world. I'm confused by everything. Shutterstock? Oh, no, you're right. Because the problem is, like, like oftentimes when I want to make something, I'll make a website or maybe some kind of uh, video. Like, I always think I have to go out and shoot stuff myself. Turns out that's not the case. I went around. I flew to Singapore once to take a picture of a Singaporean dollar. Turned out that was a lot of money wasted. I could have just gone to Shutterstock.com, typed in Singaporean dollar, which I don't think is what they call it. I'm but pretty uh, sure And then not. used that photo. <laughs> Would have had the rights in perpetuity as part of my license because they got pretty much everything at Shutterstock. They do. Let me tell you. At Shutterstock.com, you will find the perfect image or video for your next creative project. And whether it's for your website, a publication, an advertising, a video, or any other type of project, Shutterstock most likely has it in their inventory of over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips. You see, Shutterstock sources images from around the world, and then they put it at your fingertips. Many contributors to Shutterstock are professional photographers and artists, and Shutterstock reviews each image individually for content and quality before adding it to its library. Shutterstock adds 20,000 images every day, so every time you visit, you will find something new. That means that every time you're doing a project, you could come back over and over again, and maybe, just maybe, they'll find that perfect picture, that perfect video, that perfect setup for your next project. Shutterstock also offers flexible pricing. You can choose individual image packs or a monthly subscription for the best deal. You can download 25 images a day with any standard subscription. And you can download any image in any size and only pay once. Shutterstock gives you the images that you need to bring your creative product projects to the next level. And they make it easy because Shutterstock has sophisticated search tools that let you search and drill down by subject, color, file, type, gender, emotion, and more. It's not just one big 
potpourri of images and media. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It sounded like you said emotion. Are you saying like there's a difference between searching robot or sad robot? That's that's what I'm telling I'm telling you right now. You you can search for just the sad robot and only find robots, only images that really emote that sadness. That's the kind of sophistication that's... Look, there you go. That's the kind of sophistication that Shutterstock has. Sad robots. Sad <laughs> robots. That's a lot of sad robots. That's a lot of sad robots. <laughs> Why isn't Max Trollbot in there? Now, let's let's continue. Let's continue. But, but you know what? You know what else, Brian? No, yeah? That, that was a question. Dude, I like I like this fail robot right there. I He's did. just hanging his head in shape. Isn't believe. that Keanu Reeves robot? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, but you know, aside from sad robots, Sh Shutterstock also has shareable light boxes that let you save images to a light box gallery and then access them anytime and share them with other team members. Anyone who's ever done a creative project with more than one person knows how important this is to be able to shoot someone over to somebody else and say, hey, is this what we're looking for? Is this the sad robot that we need? Are these the droids we're looking for? And they have an award-winning iPad app. You get to search on the go, and it uses it to display images during presentations, which means that you can call it up and make it your perfect presentation toolkit. Shutterstock is also a global marketplace. They have a multilingual customer service in more than a dozen international countries and full-time customer support throughout the week. Today, I found a few interesting images on Shutterstock, which uh, Brian helped me to bring out. That sad robot is just, you know, it's, it's something that... I've been thinking about for a while, doing some sort of creative project that involves robots with emotions, because, you know, that's that's well, unique in sci-fi. Now, sure. here's, here's what we would want you to do. And actually, no, I think Brian knows this the best. Brian, how and why would they sign up for a free account? Uh, well, you, look, you sign up for a free account, you take a poke around, and then when you do sign up, because we know you're gonna, why don't you go ahead and knock off, what, 5, 10, 15, screw no, all those. No, no. 25% off. There we I've go. I've decided. All you got to use is promo code TWIT1013. That's TWIT1013, 25% off. And not only, people always think about, like, because you're selfish. All of you at home are selfish, and, and I hate you for it. Uh, it's not just the 25%. It's the fact that you're supporting This Week in Tech. That's right. That's right. If you go to Shutterstock.com and enter in that code TWIT1013, you will support This Week in Tech. And that's why we thank Shutter Shutterstock for their support of TWIT. Now, let's get on to a different kind of story because I think we've had enough of all this <laughs> hacking and Not me. touring and drugs bitcoins and, and drugs. Hitmen and virtual yeah, currencies yeah, and you know, all this or exploit economics. stuff. So let's talk about a new yeah. story. Yeah, let's talk about hacking of IE. That's right. There's a brand new story about... <laughs> <laughs> you can see where I'm, I'm sorry, going with this. I thought you you said a new story. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Now. Oh, oh no, but this is new. We've actually got video. This is an interesting story about a new exploit called CVE 2013-3893, which allows people to access a DLL in Internet Explorer that essentially lets them control everything that you're logged into. It's We called it a browser pivot, and we actually covered it two weeks ago on This Week at Enterprise Tech when we had Raphael Mudge, who is one of these program, Uber programmers who works a lot with Metasploit, who showed us exactly how an exploit like this can work. Here's a tool I've been working on, and it's called browser pivoting. And I'm going to inject myself as the attacker into the target's um, Internet Explorer. And what this is going to do, it's going to create a proxy server that I, the attacker, can go through, tunneled through my remote administration tool, and this is going to allow me to access anything that the user's logged into. So if I go to, for example, Yahoo Mail in my browser as the attacker, oh, look, I'm in the user's email. Now, and I can let's make it clear. This is not an RDP exploit. You're actually using the browser process. Yeah, I'm in their browser. I'm in my browser on my attacker system. Now I'm able to go through this web application that the user authenticated to without them knowing. Now this was uh, uh, listen. I'm I'm sorry. You know, normally I totally respect you in all regards, Padre SJ. But the fact that you allowed him to get away with calling this a browser pivot when clearly <laughs> it's a mudge budge oh, no. just defies me. <laughs> I will bring it up with him. We're going to have him on the show on a regular basis, so I'm, I'm going to have to have you and him, to, you know, so you can, <laughs> you can express your displeasure. No, but I mean, 
This is one of these exploits that uh, I, I, it's probably the most impressive one I've seen in years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was literally able to do this as we were on the show. He he ran Metasploit. He was able to find the vulnerability, insert himself, and start surfing as the user. Now this isn't this is one of these exploits that sends information back to a computer. It doesn't report to a botnet. It actually lets an attacker access any site on your browser that you're logged into as you. I mean, think about how many times you go to a website and it knows who you are, mm -hmm. or you, uh, your email server, it's already logged in, your financial information, your, your username and password have been stored so that you don't have to remember it each and every single time. They get access to that if they browser pivot but, on you. But so what do they need to actually do this, perform this exploit? Do they need your IP address? They need you to run internet. They target you? They need to run. You need to run Internet Explorer and go to a website, and they run their that and oh, that okay, loads yeah. their JavaScript onto your system. Right, and then all so, hell so breaks if, loose. If you go, if you go to the uh, to the offending website to one of the yeah. Okay, I get it. Oh, but yeah, see, it's that, terrifying. This I, this is I, not this is not one of these exploits where you have to visit a site to to download the malware onto your computer. Um, oh no, sure. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it yeah, okay. And yeah. so it's built into it's, the Metasploit framework now, which means that anyone with a finger, well, no, let me to use Metasploit properly does take a little bit of skill. It's not a total script kitty tool. But anyone running the latest version of Metasploit can could conceivably walk into a campus network, uh, which is typically not the most protected <laughs> system on the planet, plug in scan all the ports and all the IPs that are currently on their network, find the computers that have this vulnerability, drop the vulnerability on top of the icon from that computer, and boom, they now have complete access to everything that person has been doing in IE. Now, here's the really scary part. There are some people who think, well, I would know if someone's remote controlling my computer. It, that really doesn't work that way. Uh, unless you are paying incredibly close attention, almost superhuman attention to the amount of resources being used by your computer, you would have no idea that someone is doing this and it would leave no signs that you could pick up later. Because it just looks like you. It just looks like you. The computer thinks you're using your browser. And basically, so somebody logged into, I don't have to go to a website, it's, it's, it's a JavaScript injection, but somebody running Metas Metasploit on my network would be able to squirt this onto my machine. Correct. So should we, should we explain there's a fix? I mean, one, why hasn't Microsoft issued a security update for yeah. this yet? Because there's a there's a, a Microsoft Fix-It, and I love Microsoft Fix-It because it's this strange little remote thing where it fixes your machine, but um, as long as it's secure. But why hasn't Microsoft implemented this patch yet? I think it's because most people at Microsoft use Firefox. <laughs> Wham. Okay, no, sorry. No, no, that's, yeah, this should, this is a critical vulnerability. Uh, th I mean, this scared me more than anything. A lot of vulnerabilities look scary, but, right. uh, you know, they're so now, hard to it, pull uh, off. Uh, uh, Robert, what what is it that's special about Internet Explorer that makes this vulnerability uniquely possible on it? And I understand there, you know, there's, is, is there anything theoretically that says that a similar type of attack couldn't happen on other browsers? It, well, Technically, I guess it could, but they don't use the same DLLs. The problem right. here was the way that IE is written and the the, uh, the dynamic linking libraries that it uses aren't really locked down. Uh, not that well. I mean, right. because remember, you're always balancing accessibility, flexibility, the ability to use a platform with the ability to keep it secure. This is one of those oopsies. They, they never thought that someone would be injecting themselves in this way, and, and now they're getting burned. That's that's basically the history of security vulnerabilities in right. Windows or any other platform. Wait, somebody will climb in through an open window? Yeah. Okay, somebody will open a an unlocked door. Okay, they can open a locked door if it's a bad lock. Okay, they'll, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's this... It's layer of crazy, but it's. I love the 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 CVE MITRE .org entry on this. Use after free vulnerability in the set mouse capture implementation and, and MS HTML DLL and Microsoft Internet Explorer six through eleven allows remote attackers to execute an arbitrary code. It's just obscure and it's in the mm -hmm. IE DLLs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there will be other horrible security problems in the other browsers that just don't happen to be this particular one, Brian. <laughs> Yeah. Sure, sure. But you know, I see the tie-in to our previous discussion because, again, people are always concerned about the transport layer, that, that pipe I have to the Internet being spied on, right. when, honestly, it's a lot easier to compromise either the end user's computer or the end user himself or the server that the user is accessing. Uh, so, you know, really, this is, this is the stuff we should be worried about. This is the stuff that we should be concerned about. My computer could be owned right now if I had ever actually used Internet Explorer, <laughs> and I wouldn't have a clue that someone had just accessed all the sites that I had accessed on my browser.
Nothing. So there. Take that, Steve Ballmer. <laughs> Speechless. Speechless. No, I'm still thinking, like, this is also a great excuse to blame some horrible thing on your computer. Like, it's not me, Mom. It's just Metasploit. <laughs> 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 My brother ran Metasploit. Triggered it. Yeah. No. Oh, we, we should mention that there is a fix right now. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll drop it yeah. into the show notes. Microsoft did issue a fix-it um, in uh, uh, the, what, mid-September or so. Yeah. So if you are using IE, if you're stuck with IE, if you love IE, please, please don't surf to another site until you have run that tool. Yeah, I would just say, actually, period, uh, if you are on a Windows box, just run this. All right. All right. Just just do it, just in case. Yeah. Okay, you know, okay, guys, I'm, I'm done. I'm sick of it. <laughs> forget the hacking, forget Tor, forget encryption. Let's let's go yeah, on to something else in the news. Let's have good news for a change, let's, Bob. Yeah, let's <laughs> good news, good news. Here we go. So Adobe just got hacked, and uh, evidently they lost a bunch of credit cards and source code. How's that? That sounds that sound good for you? it's not very bad, right? When you say hacked, you mean like somebody um, somebody just got into some nonsensical side job. It's not, it, does, it won't affect, like, clients of Adobe. Right, no, no, no. Really it, Adobe's core business, right? It, it was really non-consequential. It was, it was just you know, 40 gigabytes worth of data. A mere. 40 gig oh, ah, look I, I got 40 I, I got terabytes of data what's 40 gigs <laughs> what could be in that 40 gigs that would be such a big deal oh, man well I mean the, the little bit of the about 2.9 million customer credit cards two, two, two point nine. I'm sorry it sounded like you said 2.9 million customer credit cards two was just hacked from million. Adobe two point so like million yeah pretty much anyone who's a client of Adobe yeah. Or Adobe's court business may be a little bit compromised. Well, and and, yeah. and the, the the source code for Acrobat, yeah, which, which means reader, which means that people now have a much better way to compromise it. Because PDF files, yeah, they're going away, right? They're not popular. Yeah. 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 If you thought your Adobe Reader was insecure before, now that the bad guys have the actual source code. <laughs> No, this, yeah. yeah, this is, they're they're really trying to downplay it, and they're doing one of these things where I don't think they know how to respond to it. So they said, yeah, we've we've been breached, mm -hmm. and but, but it's not that bad. And as details keep trickling out, it's turning out how bad it, it how bad it was. First it was, there's, a, there's been a breach, we're right. not sure what was taken. Then there was, there's a breach, and we think some credit cards have been exposed, but it was all the encrypted stuff. Then it became, well, there's 2.9 million credit cards and accounts that have been exposed, and now it's and they may have walked away with source code for some of yeah. our most popular products. All right. So so keeping in in you know theme with my predisposition to be counterintuitive here, uh, is this a weird time to remind people that in cases of fraud, your liability is zero with your credit cards? Your liability like, is fifty dollars. Look. Uh, well, no, 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 it was, but I believe even that's even oh. gone. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert, but I believe uh, for, for years it was okay. it was $50 was the maximum liability, but I believe it's zero now. Uh, but essentially, your liability is zero. And and there it's easy and fun for us to say, you know, oh, look, you know, I'd hate to be one of those credit cards or whatever. But the truth is, if you look at your bill, uh, I, I got signed up once for a $9 free trial for some, you know, uh, Asahi Berry crap or whatever, and I I went ballistic, changed my credit card number, called and got it rejected on there. It's it's astonishingly easy to deal with fraud in this digital age, age wow. as long as you pay attention to your bill, and and the penalties are astonishingly low if somebody tries to be fraudulent with it. Unless it turns out that they managed to hit your combined debit credit card, wipe out the contents of your bank account, cause you to bounce a bunch of checks, including maybe your rent check, then you have to turn around, cancel that card, reissue new numbers, and then to figure out whether or not you're going to keep that separate or apart and then create a whole new set of online well, payment accounts all, for that. First of all, that's why I don't do, I don't do de debit cards. I want somebody <laughs> to tell them all the money. But second of all, I believe, again, I believe that's been updated recently to where the liability is zero for debit cards as well, theoretically. Now, the liability may be zero, but it can still... It's been taken away. The liability may be zero, but it can still really screw up your life. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah, there's sort of there's nothing that. like having someone use your credit card, and it's not you. It's just maddening, which is why not Patrick only deals in Krugerrands. <laughs> uh, in Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Actually, I was lying before, um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I'm I'm with Brian. I mean, it's it's obviously a big deal. I think the the bigger deal might be the source code for yes. for you know 
uh, all yeah. the PDF tools we use could be potential time bombs now. Um, so that's, I think, a bigger deal than the credit card. Obviously, it's a problem, but uh, the, the the credit card thing, the, the liability, yes, uh, it, you could be in a situation where your account is emptied and then your your checks bounce and that's that's absolutely true but overall it's it's something that we kind of it's an inconvenience that we agree everyone collectively as a society to live with in order to get the convenience of having a credit card or a debit card um the source code issues uh, might be something that are actually making uh, the whole environment a lot less safe right see that's the thing for me credit cards are one thing and it makes for right. a good story you can always say oh it's 15 million credit cards and it sounds like it's, ba it's a bad thing but honestly that system pretty much polices itself if, right. if you've got right. a lot of credit card breaches the the, the end user you you're not going to be financially affected all that much even though it can be a major annoyance inconvenience so on and so forth i don't want right. to minimize that the 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 source code part of this story is what scares me because imagine this Imagine how many times we've heard of a vulnerability with Adobe, with uh, Adobe Reader, with, with Adobe products. Now, the way that vulnerabilities were exposed was they kept hammering at the executables. They kept hammering at the services until they found holes, and then they would exploit those holes. They don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> if they have the source code, they can actually go line by line and find out from inside where right. the weaknesses are going to be, which means they can find weaknesses that they would never have been able to find just by hammering on the executables. This, this is actually horrible. I mean, imagine how yeah. much of the world depends on Adobe products, specifically on Adobe Reader. Now, imagine what would happen if all those computers were suddenly owned. Let's go back to the exploit. Let's say that now that, that same exploit works in Firefox. It works in Chrome. It works just you sitting at your desktop. That's the kind of access that we're talking about if someone yeah. actually has the source code of software you're running on your system. It's also, I mean, it's pretty brutal. Like, okay, 2.9 million customer credit cards. Those were encrypted you know, assuming it's quality encryption, that data is probably pretty safe. But it's crazy, right? Because this appears to be a group of hackers um, um, that have broken into LexisNexis, done in Bradstreet, a whole bunch of other interesting places. And that what what happened was, uh, I'm, I'm reading Krebs on security, Alex, Alex Holden, CSI, CISO of Hold Security LLC, discovered a massive 40 gigabyte source code trove stashed on a server used by these, these cyber criminals. And what's interesting is not so much that they had the source code, but they cracked into the credit card, uh, the credit card servers, and then used that to get access to the rest of Adobe system. So there's some really bad lack of firewall going on there, or some really sophisticated hacking. Um, but then. If, if I'm reading correctly Adobe's response, Adobe is still in the process of determining what source code for other products may have been accessed by the attackers, which basically means the attackers could have been planting things in the source code to do nefarious stuff later on, which is really frightening uh, for something that, mean, that is... That sounds you, a little bit ambitious uh, for, for this one attack, uh, but, but, no, but, but this the isn't, fact but that the, it's on but, the spectrum of possibility is terrifying. This isn't, sure. this isn't one attack. This was something that they just discovered, and the reason they discovered it is because the security officer working on something else stumbled across 40 gigabytes of code, took some screenshots, and went to Adobe and said, hey, um, does this look familiar? And Adobe went, <laughs> yes, that looks familiar. I'm sorry, Chad. There was something wrong with this mic. If we could wind that back, I think. Yeah, I may have muted. I <laughs> you know, um, we are looking at the malware analysis and exploring the different digital assets we have right now. The investigation is really into the trail of breadcrumbs of where the bad guys touched. Ooh. <laughs> which, which is another way of saying, yeah, we know they got this. We don't know what else they got. And what they did with and it, and what they did with it, where it's going. I, I mean, I feel no, like I feel like all of the Twit Network should put together a get well soon card. <laughs> we could just have the whole internet sign it and send it over. I smell an NSFW episode. We just, you know what, Adobe? We know you've been feeling under the weather. Here, this is from all of us. Please fix sure. your bleep. Pa Patrick, okay, Patrick. So let's let's go back over to the the man who can give us the uh, the non-American view of this. Uh, I'm losing my cookies over this. Th does this sound like as big of a story for you as it does for me? Um, I, I think you might have a, a slightly more vested interest in this story because that's your bread and butter. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's definitely scary. Um, 
I, the thing is, not being a, a security expert, I'm kind of in the in in the shoes of the guy who sees it on on you know uh, the eight o'clock news, and and he's being told, oh holy poo, the, it's it's really horrible, and the world is gonna end. And I'm like, wait, what? It, what should I what should I do? Like, what's happening? Can I can I be safer by doing something? So. It's yes, really stop scary. using the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Our advice to you is turn off the internet right now. I Let's all go that's home. the lesson from this episode. Sorry. <laughs> stop using the internet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely scary for us too. We, we use, uh, we use uh, uh, you know, PDFs all the time and it's, it's ubiquitous and international. So yeah, to answer your question, scary for us as well. Now, Patrick pulled up a security bulletin from Adobe saying that they're going to be releasing a patch in a okay. few days. My question oh, is, please. how do you patch this? They have the source well, code. You can't, unless you oh, no, rewrote no, no. the they, program. They didn't, say, they didn't say it would actually fix anything. They just wanted you to know that there's, <sighs> there's a patch, patch. <laughs> that'll be coming out soon. It, it's going to make your images clearer. It has nothing to do with this thing. Well, <laughs> yeah, update. Uh, yeah, basically update. Uh, yeah, check for updates on October 8th. That's all I'm going to say. For Adobe Reader and Acrobat 11. This is honestly, this is one of those things where you cannot, you cannot patch this. If if they have the source code, unless you're rewriting the unless entire rewrite software. It from uh, well, sure. unless they found something in the source code that they need to <laughs> fix. Oh, wait, unless they're saying, okay, so we finally started going through our source code and we found all those holes, so we're going to fix them before they, they get to them. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. well, it's 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 funny. Like, the, the Adobe Secure Software Engineering team, the asset blog, they also say, it's kind of funny. Like, at the same time, they're saying on October 2nd, we are not aware of any zero-day exploits targeting any Adobe products. Adobe announces that they will be doing security patches for their products. So, um, you, you it could... Go Adobe. So clean that code. How is it? How is it different? <laughs> Get one soon. Different from but, but other guys, zero day uh, exploits. Okay. Okay. Well, no, actually, it's a great question. How is this different from other zero day exploits? The uh, reason, the way that this is different is because when we're talking about a zero day, day exploit, it's typically it's been created by a couple of I'll call them security researchers who have been hammering at a service until they find a hole. They find a way either to overload the stack so they can inject their own code, or they've just found a, some sort of weakness in the way that data is transferred to and from the service. This is different because they are not attacking. They're not hammering at it. Yeah. They actually have the blueprints. It would be like the difference between someone breaking into a building by going and right. checking all the windows if they're open, and someone actually having the blueprints from the building so they know, oh, there's an access shaft down there I can get through. That's sure, that's once, what we're looking at. Once you see they're in the building, you can go and lock that access shaft in the same way that you would, you know, closing the window that was open, couldn't you? Well, yeah, yeah but I mean, they don't know which of the thousand different ways to approach this building are going to be used by the attackers. Mm. That's, so you mean that's the what we're the, the, at. Quant the quantity and the 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 ease with which uh, people who want to exploit these uh, these these issues in right. the software is what makes this dangerous. Correct. There's, there's going to be more and possibly better hidden uh, attacks. Right. Oh, put it, put it, how about uh, this? Here's, here's a better way to think about it. If I'm going to run a standard exploit against a service, I have to try 10,000 different things before I get the one thing that works, right? And so if I'm a good security person, I'm actually looking at all those attempts and I realize, okay, something's brewing, something, someone's trying to get in. If I have the source code, my attack works the first time and you have no time to prepare because I've never attacked your system except for the one time that it worked. Right. That's how Padre, bad this is. Look, I'm getting real depressed here. We, <laughs> we have all these stories about bad guys being taken down and about currencies that may or may not be compromised. We've got stories about people being hacked. I, I'm, I just want one story that's not about somebody who doesn't deserve it somehow getting ahead. Okay. I want a, I want a merit-based story. What do you got? I, I got this. I got this. I got this. How about this? If you're one of these people who are wonderful enough to own a Tesla, oh, you're no. probably going to die in a fire. <laughs> 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 that's, what's funny is that's since, since not I have, the story I thought I was setting you up with. I, but this, I, this is where I went. <laughs> I have two friends that own Teslas. Please amplify the level of detail on this. <laughs> okay, so we had we had a story from last week about 
uh, this mysterious Tesla that caught fire. Uh, and, of course, the stock dropped immediately and people were saying, oh, my God, we told you this was going to be horrible. As it turns out, this was a, a single accident where some driver drove over something and ripped the heck out of the bottom of his car. The car caught on fire. Everyone took pictures of it. And now it's the Tesla Roadster is a death trap. Uh, th this, you know, this this is one of those things I, I want to bring this up because I, I do believe this is the lighter side of tech because is this not... <laughs> FUD in all its glory, right? I mean, this this is, oh my God, we were right about the electric car. Whereas, how many times do we see gas cars burst into flames? How many times do we see right. accidents destroy cars? But because it's the Tesla, it almost makes me feel that if there was ever, ever an accident with a Tesla Roadster, people would just assume that it's going to kill you. This is... Dungeons and Dragons all over again. The first time <laughs> anyone saw Dungeons and Dragons and then talking about wizard and, and conjuring devils or whatever, they yeah, we're always scared of what's new. So the first concrete example of something we have bad associated with it, we make sure to blow up. Congratulations, Tesla. You're now as awesome as Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting to read this, right? Because something I didn't realize about the Model S. So, Earlier this week, a Model S traveling at highway speed struck a large metal object, apparently a piece of a tractor trailer that had fallen off. The geometry of the object caused a powerful lever action as it went under the car, punching upward and impaling the Model S with a peak force on the order of 25 tons. Only a force of this magnitude would be strong enough to punch a three-inch diameter hole through the quarter-inch armor plate protecting the base of the vehicle. So, I, you know, like I knew there was, like, stuff protecting the batteries, and there's a lot of batteries in a Tesla S. Quarter inch plate, um, that's huge. That's yeah. twice the thickness yeah. of the the typical like safe used to store you know things in the in the in a home in the United States. Like that's that's an incredible amount of steel to wrap around the batteries. That's also an incredible amount of force to act on that steel. Yeah, well, um, that, that's the the weird part, which is so many news agencies that that ran with this story last week. They were making it out as if oh well you know they just hit something on the road you know, you know a broom. Uh, you know, bucket, and it's like no. This was a this is a shard of this was a tank killing shard of steel that yeah. got pivoted under the car and ripped into the battery pack. And yeah, in in that instance, that battery pack is going to catch fire. But I, I well, think and 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 while we're while we're on this subject, uh, Padre, like, what do you think of the fact that uh, Elon Musk uh, personally responds to all of these things? Per earlier, we saw Elon Musk respond to a bad review. That uh, somebody gave of the of the Model S, uh, saying that it that it died mid travel, and of course he dissected the data to go back and essentially call the guy a liar. Uh, and the fact that the uh, that that Elon is personally responding to you know with explanations over Twitter and of course press releases explaining exactly what happened and pointing out uh, quite correctly that he said, look, if we're going to compare apples to apples. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I forget the number. I'm probably wrong here. But he said that the gas cars are, you know, 20 times more likely to explode in a collision or whatever. Right, right. You know, well. here, here's the thing. There's There are those who are saying, wait a minute, Elon Musk, is he's acting like the irresponsible five times. CEO. There you go. Five times more likely. Right. I mean, they, they, so they say, oh, he should just shut up. He should let us PR people handle this. It's not the job of the CEO to go out there and jump on every negative story about, about his product. Uh, but And I'm only going to speak for myself right now because previously I had been speaking for the entire Catholic Church, but now it's just it's just me. <laughs> but I love now seeing you this. Tell me. I, I love seeing this kind of engagement. He is obviously a geek. He is obviously mm -hmm. passionate about this. And so I like it when he actually mixes it up with people and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back off for a second. I know it's fun to point fingers, but... Before you do that, let me give you the real data, either about the review. Let me let me show you what the computer said about his battery use, or this. Let me show you what actually penetrated the car, uh, and it's it's surprisingly refreshing to see a CEO do that. I, that's just me. I don't know if anyone shares that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I agree. Look, I mean, uh, Elon Musk is our real life Tony Stark, and I love the fact that we live in a world <laughs> where he feels appropriate to jump in and 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 call stuff out on that. Um, you know, and, and he's right by the numbers. I mean, he gave the numbers. Uh, was he said um, uh, over 150,000 car fires per year, one vehicle for every 20 million miles, and one fire in over 100. Uh, you know, basically he, he lays it out. It's like you know, his cars by the numbers, and granted the sample size is smaller, is five times safer as far if you're worried about explosions than gas vehicles. Yeah, yeah. Patrick, what about you? Is this gonna? I'm oh, sorry. I keep doing that. Not Patrick. <laughs> Is this going to put you off from that uh, that Tesla Roadster I know you have reserved? 
probably not. If if anything, it's probably going to make me more uh, likely to actually f uh, go and buy it because I think what you were saying earlier, uh, Brian, is is very true. He's not letting his PR people do the talking, and instead, what's happening is that he's saying he's he's talking normal. He's saying what all of us would like people to say in these situations. Sometimes it's it comes off as a little rough, but usually overall he's just, you know, saying what everyone thinks. And that buys him a lot of sympathy, I think. And, and he is now, I can't remember, you know, I can't count how many times he's been compared to Tony Stark, but that's a pretty good place to be in. So I'm sure he's rubbing some people the wrong way, but overall I think it's a very much a net positive for him. I think he's going to be the reverse Tony Stark. He's making cars and things that save the world now, and then he's going to start making weapons. <laughs> well, I, you know, he's going to he start off as a green a, technologist. <laughs> he's going to have such an excellent image that we're going to go like, yay, Tesla, yeah. you know, weaponry and planes and destroying things. And then he makes then he's going to start like uh, He's going to start womanizing. He's going to become a misogynist. <laughs> yeah. He's going to start snarkily replying no, to the public. Even, you know, even his weapons are going to be awesome. He's going to manage to find a way to, to like, build the Death Star or, like, AT&Ts or, like, something that's going to make it really cool. It's going I, to be I have trust in you. It's going to be smooth. Yeah. By the way, you know, the very first time I ever saw a Tesla dealership, I was walking to the Arch de Triomphe in Paris. Really? It's a lovely mm -hmm. story. It was, no, it was I, I had never, I had never, I'd seen the Tesla, but I'd never actually been in a showroom filled with them. It was I, I loved it. I just like laugh because they're all over the place. In, in this in this part of Northern California, I see a Tesla probably every other day, um, and it's kind of it's kind of weird because I know it's not like that in most of the U.S., but it's like they're everywhere. Isn't that but strange? It, yeah, I, I remember the first time I saw a Tesla, I was like, "Oh, whoa, that's the Tesla!" And now it's oh yeah, there's one. There's one. Oh, I saw one yesterday. There's, <laughs> well, there's one parked there down the go. street. So Sub zero seven two one in the chat room has it. He says the Tesla Gundam. There you go. That's the kind of thing you want to see. Go Elon Musk. Tesla awesome heavy arms. Actually, that's pretty awesome. And you know, you know what they do is they'd all have t Tesla Gundams, and you'd have like wrestling matches out in in the San Francisco Bay, and then you'd be you know, body slamming and giant waves going all over the place. Everyone cheering on the sidelines. I have no problem with that. I don't know. I, there's a really I got to say there's a really interesting article in this in the MIT Technology Review that one of the things they talk about is how the, the the one thing that came out of this that wasn't particularly positive news is it's a reminder of how hard it is to put out uh, lithium ion battery fires because right. apparently that they thought they had the fire uh, the firefighters thought they had the fire out uh, and then the, it lit it sort of reignited itself again so. I think it'll be interesting well, to see that. Patrick, while, while well, it's, it's not like gasoline is like super, you know, non-combustible. So, I, well, it, it, but it's, it's okay. So, National Fire Protection Association: seventeen automobile fires reported every hour, kill an average of four people every week. Automobile fires are ten percent of the reported U.S. fires. So, obviously, there's a lot of gas fires catching on fire. We could talk about the Crown Victoria having the gas tank behind the axle. It's been the result of, of the death or 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 disfigurement of of a lot of police officers or state troopers in the United States. Um, there there are flaws. There are flaws with gasoline as a fuel. Uh, because it, it does do that thing where it goes foomp. Um, but it's interesting at the idea, like, okay, if there, there is a lot of Teslas in between the San Francisco Fire Department and the Petaluma Fire Department or the Santa Rosa Fire Department, maybe that means all of the fire departments have to put together a better school for putting out lithium-ion battery fires. Or maybe Elon Musk probably already has a, a crew of engineers at some isolated place lighting lithium-ion batteries on fire, not that they have a lot of spare ones to burn, to figure out the best way to put the fire out. Because if they're, they're saying is if these things heat up and more electrolyte leaks out as a response to the heat and electrolyte reignites, that's problematic, right? No matter so, how unlikely it is to happen. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the MIT review, uh, which made me instantly think of another awesome story from this week, which was the, the self-assembling uh, cube robots. Did you guys see this? Uh, the swarm, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know if we're up against a break, but, but that's definitely something I want to talk about. You know what? You know what, Brian? We're going to talk about that right after I take some time to talk about a spot. <laughs> well, yeah, I never saw that coming. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. That's why I was asking if they're happy to bring. You never know. But there you might know, be I, a moment. We got to thank the people who make this week in tech possible. Yeah, and honestly, I you know I don't know much about this next sponsor. Uh, who is? They're called what? 
Maybe you could help me with this. Square Spas? What is that, oh. Brian? <laughs> if, if I'm not mistaken, they're actually named in advance for the MIT robots, which are vaguely cube-like. Squarespace uh, is a robot that will destroy the world. Is that, is that is, am I thinking of the right Squarespace? I, I think so. I think I think this episode of This Week in Tech was actually brought to us in part by Squarespace. Oh, wait. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you said CubeBot. Uh, oh, Squarespace, okay. My bad. My bad. The fantastic all-in-one platform that allows you to make amazing high-quality blogs, portfolios, or any kind of website, and you don't need to have any kind of background or skill because their templates look so good. Whether you're a CSS wizard or somebody who doesn't know the difference between an H, a T, an M, and R L, then Squarespace has got you covered. If you need an exceptional-looking website and you need it right now and you need it to look good, whether it's on an iPhone, on an Android, on an iPad, whether any kind of tablet or a desktop computer, they're going to make you look fantastic. Yeah, they are. And you know, one of the things that I love about Squarespace is that they allow me to channel my inner Leo. And what my inner Leo is telling me about Squarespace is that you're going to like them because they're always improving their platform. You see, they, every time we advertise Squarespace on the Twit network, they've got new features with new designs, even better support than before, which I didn't think was possible. They've also got beautiful designs. They have more than 20 new templates for you to start with and all the style options that you need to create a unique website for you or your business. Brian knows about this. You know, you don't want to buy into one of these packages and, and then find a beautiful website that looks just like a thousand other beautiful websites. They let you, you know customize. I I mean, that's the thing. It's like when I get to a decision gate like this, I ask my inner Leo what I should do. Inner Leo, what kind of website should I get? You should get... A Squarespace website! Your inner Leo commands you! You know, there's something wrong with your inner Leo. You, you, may, <laughs> you may need to get that looked at. But, but my inner Leo reminds me that Squarespace has actually won several awards, including from the FWA, the Webbies, from Forbes. That's right, they get awards, just like NSFW show won that big chat realm thing thing. The thing. That weird. <laughs> uh, by, by the way, one of my favorite stories, and it's a true story, uh, formerly of Totally Rad Show, Jeff Kanata had his personal website on Squarespace, and he used one of the default templates and was surprised to find himself on the list of 50 website, uh, what was it, uh, designs to be inspired by. Like, he was on a curated list of, like, this is an exceptional site. And they didn't know that he had just used the default uh, template from Squarespace. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, one of the other things that I like about Squarespace is you don't have to be a programmer. It's it's really that easy to use. And they're inexpensive. In fact, I think they're only about eight dollars a month, which which you know puts them right in that that realm of possibility for even mm -hmm. the most novice, the most simple, the most basic user of web services. It's incredibly easy to use. But you know what? If you want some help, Squarespace has a support team that will work with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that $8 plan I talked about, that includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. So basically it's a wash with trying to do it yourself. Why would you do it yourself if you could get an entire team of experienced professionals behind you? you, you know, Keep Brian, in mind. Yeah. Here's the best part about Squarespace is they use distributed hosting. So if your site suddenly becomes super popular or better yet, if somebody tries to like DDoS you, they're going to find that they just walked into a club made of diamonds. They're going to be in some kind of diamond club and they won't be able to permeate the walls. They can't take them down. That's the strength of the diamond club. Yeah, and you know what else that Diamond Club does? It does search engine optimization automatically. You may know that, that SEO wow. thing. Yeah, yeah. It's how you get yeah, found sure. on the internet. Yeah. And with Squarespace, they, they, they advertise for you. They ensure that your site's content can be found under the search terms that it needs to be found. So, so if you are, you know, part of that club that's kind of diamondy, you don't have to go and pay another service to do your, engine, your search engine opti optimization. It's built into the package. That's, that's the brilliance of our friends over at Squarespace. Look, tell me two things. All I want to know is how can I try it out for free and how can I give a kickback to our friends here at This Week in Tech? Well, let me let me tell you that first part. The first part is it's it's even better than free. You see, they they let you start it with no credit card required. That's right. Not one of those annoying sites that says, "Yeah, we'll give you a month free, but first give us all the information about you." No, no, that's not Squarespace's thing. They they want you to try the service, see if you like it, see if you're comfortable with it. Then, if you like it, you go ahead and buy it. So when you decide to sign up for Squarespace, and this ad should have convinced you to sign up for, for Squarespace, make sure to use our offer code TWIT10, and you'll get 10% off 
and uh, you'll show your support to This Week in Tech. Now, we thank Squarespace for This Week in Tech, but we also thank them for everything they do for the Twit TV network. Brian, is there really anything better than Squarespace? Um, I was going to say, like, the birth of my first child, but eh, we're going to go Squarespace. Yeah, I think, I think we have to go Squarespace. That's... That's how we do things. He went there, straight to the children. Yeah, we <laughs> Shameless. Ooh, wait. Ooh. Okay. Uh, Brian, take us away from that. What, what's this thing about the swarm bots? Okay, all right. So MIT made this, uh, uh, they, they, they made these individual cubes. Each one is about the size of a child's uh, building block. You picture the ABC blocks that you have in your hand. Uh, and inside... They, they figured out that most robots are built for stability. They're built for mobility with legs or some kind of treads or whatever. And that uh, to run those things, you require all kinds of gears. They built these little bots that are um, uh, they're, they're self-organizing. They're autonomous. And they move purely by a little flywheel inside that spins up to 20,000 RPM. And then by doing it, they realized they could spin it real fast and then stop it. And the, the, the block would jump forward. And they discovered this quite by accident. But then they realized that putting uh, magnets on the outside of it would allow them to essentially create... You know, when you watch Transformers and you see, you know, basically a boombox melt into all of a sudden a 20-foot tall robot or whatever, and you're like, nothing can move that way. Or you watch the T-1000 melt into liquid metal and you're like, nothing can move that way. Essentially, they've created a framework that really can do that. These cubes, self-organized, they look like... Um, Tetris uh, pieces right now, but uh, and in fact, we just talked about this on the uh, the Weird Things podcast. It is astonishing to watch these things in action. I know uh, uh, Chad's going to bring it up on screen right now. Jump to about uh, yeah, about uh, two thirds of the way in right now, uh, and you'll be there. You go right about there. You'll be able to see these things moving around, and for the first time, you can see how these things could uh, 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 essentially do the stuff that we've only seen in science fiction until now. Okay, am, am I the only one terrified by these spinning blocks of death? <laughs> is, is, that, is that just me? It's because I'm, I'm looking at that thinking, this, this is how I'm going to die. No, okay, here's how you're going to live. Because what will happen is, eventually, you'll just decide to download your brain into one of these things, and then we'll all be awesome gray goo overlords. If I'd my... rather die. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather die and trust my intelligence to whatever comes next. I do not want to be trapped in a spinning box. <laughs> I actually, I, I feel like I am trapped in a spinning box, so that wouldn't be that much of a difference. Oh. Oh, th th I always love, I love stories like this because, you know, especially when you've got students who are, who are just messing around, they've come up with these concepts that someone is going to use this, this idea of a self-assembling robot, of robots that can create structures with very simple mechanisms. This is going to make its way into some product that eventually will click and someone will say, oh, that's right, why didn't we think of that before? Uh, yeah, yeah maybe, it's really astonishing, and, and, maybe, and, and, uh, and maybe not. Yeah, maybe it's, not. I mean, yes. it is it is astonishing. It is definitely something that is super interesting. I mean, to look at it, they look alive, and I guess that's what mm -hmm. makes it especially enticing for us. It, it's technology that really looks. It's not a robot. It's just a box, but it does look somewhat alive. Uh, it, it, there's a really, 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 really long way from this to something actually useful, though. This is fundamental research, almost. Uh, and, and it could be, I'm playing devil's advocate here, sorry, but it could be that this just remains jumping boxes and it turns into, you know, a children's toy and nothing more. Um, I don't really see how these uh, boxes could become something, you know, you would need to have mechanisms and like for them to do something else, it, they would need to have a lot more on board or like to assemble into different geometric forms that could move in unison. Uh, it, it's very, very early on and I don't want to yeah. be the, the, the grouch here, but I could see this become awesome. I could also see this become just, you know, nothing. You know what, Brian? So I, I now agree with not Patrick. This story is bad, and you should feel bad. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you what. You say that, complex. I'm going to send my army of 100,000 cube bots to absorb you. <laughs> okay. Let, let's move on to something else that I think is awesome that is probably also going to be shot down by our, our esteemed not Patrick. And that is, guess what they're selling at Ikea now? Solar panels. Uh. 
Wait, Q-Bots? Uh, well, yes, yeah, so Q-Bots that put themselves into solar panels. Now, this is only happening across the pond. It's in 17 British stores. They're talking about uh, a couple of Chinese-made systems that will sell for roughly $9,200. The idea is now that you can walk into Ikea, and in the same aisle that you buy your USK, which is some sort of desk, you get to buy a system that will go up on the roof and provide at least partial power to your house. Now... This is something that people predicted about solar in the United States so long ago that you would be able to buy and walk into a Best Buy and buy something that will help to remove yourself from the grid, but it never materialized for any number of reasons, including a lot All of right. regulation. Why is this uh, now possible in, in, in British stores? I mean, uh, to be honest, there's only one thing I care about. Like, do they actually do anything? Are you spending $100 so you can save $9.35 on your overall electric bill? This is conspicuous consumerism. And obviously, uh, this uh, is what happens when you have... Uh, oh, no, oh. no. Okay. no. All right, go no. on. Lay it on me, Patrick. Okay, what do you first, got? Of all, first of all, they're talking about with the, with the, what's available in terms of purchasing subsidies in, in the U.K., you're talking about um, a seven-year payoff Wait, so, on a product that should have a 30-year lifespan, right? All right, all right no, 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 no. You, you, said, you said subsidies, though, right? Well, okay, even if it's not, even if it's a full $9,000, I think it takes it up to 10-year payoff for a product with a 30-year lifespan. It's like, like, on one hand, I get what you're saying, like, oh, God, just we need somebody else spending $100,000 on an electric car to prove how green they are because they're using coal-generated electricity in their giant lithium-ion-packed vehicle <laughs> to move without fossil fuels through the yes, highways. Yes, that's exactly what I'm worried about. <laughs> Don't give me. You got to remember something. I live in Northern California. I drive a 7,000-pound, three-quarter ton diesel truck, but I'm running biodiesel, which is actually domestically produced from recycled freaking Frito-Lay potato chip oil, which means I have a lower footprint in terms of actual carbon energy consumption than a freaking Prius because my fuel has pulled the carbon out of the air recently. Take that back off, lady. Just, I'm going to go hug a tree. I'm doing it in my own way, and my way isn't a Prius. My way can pull an Airstream. Now that I've had my Northern California rant out of the way, <laughs> I do believe in solar cells. I do believe in solar energy. I do believe in the Million Roof Initiative here in California because the idea, anytime you take digging stuff out of the ground to produce energy you've done something positive it may take a while to pay off you should do the math you should investigate the company that's offering to do this but i like the idea of actually self-containing energy inside of a home this is a good thing brian don't be all negative about it please okay what what but here's what i'm saying is there's the gap right there's what you pay up front there's the environmental point. cost of the manufacturer of the product right it's it's easy to look at this kind of story and just say this thing be good. Why is America bad? Because it's, it's like, Ikea. Uh, How can Ikea? Ikea's just, they're just warm and fuzzy. It's not like they create a lot of furniture no, that ends up in landfills. You know why Ikea's bad? It's because you need a goddamn pirate treasure map to find your way out of the goddamn place. <laughs> that so, is not okay. So your problem isn't, I feel like we're in therapy group. <laughs> group, let's all approach Brian with positive energy and bring Brian love. Brian, your issue really isn't with Ikea or conspicuous consumerism. It's the fact that you want to buy some obscure, bizarrely named thing and you can't find it in the big giant ass store. Is that right, Brian? Look, I, I think we've had a breakthrough here. <laughs> I, I think what is interesting, though, is the idea that if it's if it wasn't, you know, you can kind of do a version of this with Costco in the United States where they have a partnership with a solar cell supplier and you spend 12 grand and you get a box full of solar panels and inverters and you can put that on the top of your house or better yet, have an electrician with a clue put it on top of your house um you know it's just it's just i think the only reason this is new is because it's ikea so it means it's probably what is its name i mean did they talk about uh, its goofy swedish name a juice a juice it's, it's called, <laughs> it should be called juice that. box Sioler, <laughs> and there's like a uh, slash through the o and Sioler, and there's an umlaut over the a i made all of that up that's it's, you it's can perfect have that though. ikea yeah. no but th i think that's the idea the idea is if it's made it into IKEA, then yes, it is con it is consumer consumer consumable, but I think that's a good thing. I'm I'm with Patrick here. You know, if, if you're bringing it into the realm of the consumer, of the person who's just making that buy because they think it's going to make their house better, it means it's no longer up in the stratosphere where only those who are either really rich or just really want to show off the solar system on top of their house can buy into this. Now, someone who says, "Wait a minute." Okay, let me do the math here. Ten years, three years, whatever it's going to be. After that, I get free power. I like that idea. I mean, how can you not like that? 
Well, mainly because uh, we, we oftentimes, and keep in mind, this is a long-running thing. We're looking at 15 years now that we've had subsidies propping up the solar uh, industry. And, and keep in mind, uh, I would love it. Nothing would make me happier than for solar to say, screw you, don't, we don't need the subsidies anymore. We are, you know, for every dollar you spend on a solar panel, right. you get $2 worth of energy out of it. That's where we want to be. We all agree on that. But, uh, but it's, it's difficult and, and it's very easy to come up with excuses why, with why solar isn't here. And the real reason is, is because it's hard. It's hard to come up with something right. that's energy efficient, that's clean to create for the environment, that people can buy affordably. And if we could, somebody would just make it overnight and then we would all buy it. And of course, there's a messy process as we get here. And when I read a story like this that says, how come Europe can have magic solar panels that make everything rainbows and we can't? Uh, it's very easy to say, you know, because big oil and something about Dick Cheney. I, I, I hate that argument. It's a false but, dichotomy, but, but and it's wait, idiotic. Okay, 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 Brian, Brian, Brian. <laughs> wait a second. Did anyone say because big oil and Dick Cheney? I think the story is just... Hey, there are solar solar panels at IKEA. That's kind of cool. Uh, no, that's just it, Patrick. If that was the story, then I would be thrilled. But you'll notice the headline reads: "There's solar panels at IKEA in Europe. What's stopping them from coming to America?" It's like, dude, it's I hate that stuff. Because we already wait, have wait. a lot of options. Because we can buy them at Costco for less money. Okay, wait, hold on. <laughs> let, let, let me let me be in the voice of neutrality here. Uh, and not Patrick, I'm going to ask you this question. And that is, it's clear to me that, so Patrick wants to save the planet and Brian wants to destroy the planet. Where do you fall in between <laughs> <Yes>. that? <laughs> um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm married to, to a Swedish Finn. Uh, so I think I'm contractually obliged to side with uh, whatever IKEA is doing. So. <laughs> Um, was that yeah, part of I the vows? I think so. <laughs> as as we recited them, I think it was somewhere in there, you know. I vowed no, to to obey, Swedish, to love, and to I, buy solar. Yeah. Or you solar? Know, the, 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 the Nokia thing was already hitting us pretty hard in, in my couple. So I really think I shouldn't say anything bad about IKEA. So. <laughs> yeah. Save a marriage, no, think, change the subject. I, <laughs> I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, I think IKEA, what, what, the fact that it's arriving at, at IKEA, it, it's obviously a test. Uh, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with big oil or, or, you know, with Dick Cheney's evil plans to ruin the, the planet. It's just that they're testing it in that market first, as many companies often do. And if it's super successful, I'm fairly sure they're going to, you know, bring it over to other places. You know why? Because they like money. And if they sell, they're going to sell it to other people. So it's, I don't think there's anything nefarious there. And I didn't read the article, but if they're saying there's something nefarious, they're probably misguided. And I don't think either that these panels are, you know, magically becoming better because they're they're uh, at ikea it's just that they're a little bit more uh readily accessible and that's probably a good thing for those who want to use them I like uh, oh god i was gonna say i like one of the comments in the chat room there are rice soda pops in chinese mcdonald's u.s must wait i mean you know <laughs> brian got totally <laughs> brian schwid got totally scammed on a title you got sucked in on a title because it's like the second paragraph of this article is so benign but it might be a while longer before their american counterparts will be able to do the same conspiracy i think the la times trolled brian i think that's what happened <laughs> It, it Dude, it's not what, hard to tell, Brian. All you got to do is imply that someone thinks they're better than someone else. Like, what? <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, I'd like to say, as before we move on, that you three being married with kids and me being celibate, I'm more each carbon other. neutral uh, than I, any of you. you know that, like, <laughs> okay. Like, like we're I, all married to each other. I could drive a Suburban <laughs> around the city throwing coal out the window and I'd still be more carbon neutral but than But if you just burn the car That's cold, right. that would pretty That's much right. fix it. <laughs> <laughs> now, right after the break, we are going to come back and I'm going to wind up Brian once more because I have one more story that I'm sure is going to just do just, now, just like that. Just like that. Brian, could, could you, what's what's that? I, I, it's like, I didn't even know what you're up to, but you know how to get my goat. And I'm going to go to the bathroom. Screw this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> while, while Brian is taking care of his solar problem, I want to take some time to talk about GoToMeeting because they are a supporter of This Week in Tech. Now, if you've watched any of my shows, you know that I love GoToMeeting because we all understand that we need to meet. We need to talk to our colleagues, to our coworkers, to our customers. We need to have that face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact in order to get things done. But 
when you work in different offices in different cities in different countries sometimes it's just difficult to get that face-to-face -face time which is why we love go to meeting with hd faces it's the incredibly easy way to meet online and see each other in hd now you see with go to meeting you can share screens it makes it easier for your team to be on the same page and if you turn on your webcam it makes it that simple for your meeting to become an hd video conference imagine the kind of data that you get when you can actually see the person that you're talking to. It's not just a voice coming over a speaker. It's not a disembodied uh, stream of words coming at you. You can see that small frown or that raised eyebrow or that slightly quizzical look on someone's face that tells them you don't understand or I don't understand you and therefore you need to continue. That's what you get with GoToMeeting. You get that extra dimension of communication. One of the things I love about GoToMeeting is that it works from anywhere. I've used it on my laptop. I've used it on my desktop. I've used it on my phone. They make it easy for me to meet and share from anywhere, even from my iPad. You can present from your iPad how much coolness is that, to be that mobile and that connected at the same time. I love GoToMeeting, and you know I mean it because I'm not just an endorser of the product. I use it on a daily basis. I, I use this product to talk with the dozens of people that I need to talk to in my real job around the country, around the world. I use GoToMeeting, and I love it, and I know that you will too. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to try GoToMeeting. I want to see if you're going to find it to be as valuable as I do. So to try GoToMeeting free for 30 days, visit GoToMeeting.com, go, go -to click the Try It Free button, and use the promo code TWIT. That's GoToMeeting.com, promo code TWIT. GoToMeeting, meeting is believing, and we thank Citrix for their support of This Week in Tech. Guys, I want to bring it home with uh, one more story here. Praise yourselves. And um, <laughs> I know. And it has, it has no, Brian's totally going to love this. I mean, I know he's, he's right on board uh, with the fact that the FAA panel has suggested that they sort of relax the standards on turning off devices on airplanes. Because, because you know, I, I know Brian was a big proponent of having those devices off in the first place because he believes it's the government's place to make sure that we're all safe. So that cell phone, which could potentially down your 747 on its approach, well, it, you know, it, it was right that it was off. Brian, I mean, you're, you're lamenting this decision, right? I mean, you're, you're just... I just want to cry. This is the best news I've heard in my life. Hey, well, when did this happen? They said they say you can keep your devices on during takeoff and landing? No. Oh, not quite. The FAA no. received the report and recommendations today on the expanded use of personal electronic devices. FAA spokesman Les Dorr toward Mashable in a mail on Monday. The administrator will review the report and determine next steps. Right. So essentially they've said, you know what, maybe we were a bit too strict. Uh, we should look at the policies again. So there's no there's no right. recommendation saying, hey, you know what, if they want to start up a fax machine in the middle of takeoff, go ahead. But <laughs> at least this is a step in the right direction. Yes. Padre SJ, let this be the day that goes down in history is the only day that a priest gave me false hope. Well, <laughs> 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 Only the day? Hope is there. Wow. The hope is it's there. Just, it's, it's pretty good average. The yeah, it's here's the thing uh, though. But, okay, oh, go ahead. Oh, the, the report does not recommend changing rules restricting activities that require a network connection such as voice calls or data transfer. Those will likely remain off limits as rules for cell phone use on planes have been governed by the FCC since nineteen ninety one. The advisory committee did suggest the FAA should work with the FCC to regress or, excuse me, reassess those restrictions as well, the Wall Street Journal reported. Yeah. I, I, so, I, I like to read this story in concert with, uh, I believe it was three or four months ago, there was a researcher who showed that he could overpower the uh, the uh, navigation computer inside of a computer, if, if inside of a plane, if he had a transmitter in first class that was aimed towards that computer with enough power, he could actually send it false signals and take the plane off course. Now, I think we would all notice if someone had a big old satellite dish looking thing pointed towards <laughs> the cockpit, but uh, you know what the FAA is essentially saying is, look, unless it's unless unless you're that guy, yeah, the device you bring on the plane, it's got no ability to cause any sort of crash or incident or accident. Well, yes and no. They're saying it should remain in airplane mode. You're you're not supposed to be using, you know, your your network data right. transmitting parts of your device. But how but many mean, of us? How many of us have accidentally left the phone on while yeah, taking off? It's, it it's up in the overhead but, bin and okay. uh, 
No, that's can, a good can point. I say, like, uh, can I say that this story and this continuing story over the past, <laughs> I don't know, two or three years, now I'm going to be the European guy. Oh. The, the, I mean, this is a very, I'm not going to say American, this is a very American centric <laughs> Thing. it's i understand this is this is an important topic and it needs to be discussed and yes i want to be using my ipad for the 10 minutes and take off and landing that i can't use it but i mean come on the proportion of coverage that this issue using air quotes has been getting on tech shows is ridiculous and yes mention it here and there but is it that big an issue in your lives that you that we need to discuss it every ah I mean, come on. Do you, it's how, not, how often do you fly? Patrick, not yeah. That often, yeah. Do, do you realize, do. not Patrick, that the only reason I still subscribe to Wired Magazine is because it's the only magazine that, that I can read during that 10 minutes of takeoff and landing. And let me tell you, for the record, I do not approve of people leaving their iPads on inside their backpacks underneath the seat in front of them on 3G networks. I do not approve of people who leave their uh, iPhones on in their pockets and then only put on one earbud as they pretend to be asleep so they can continue listening to their audiobook during takeoff and landing. That's not okay because it's against the law and we should no longer have to stand for that illegal behavior. So decriminalize Schwood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, I well see this this just confirms what I always knew about you, Brian. You I mean you are a big proponent of the nanny state. Oh uh, I, I like I like chicks who dress up as nannies. That's kinda hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's really an overshare, Brian. It mean, yeah, really we, is an overshare. Uh, let me let me find another story really quickly. Uh, <laughs> um, awkward. All right, all right. I, I, here's here's one story. It's actually semi serious. Let's let's take it back. Take it down a notch. Okay, we've we've had our fun with exploding cars and death rays on planes. You know, Twitter's going IPO, right? And so. As Twitter goes IPO, there are some obvious comparisons between it and Facebook. Uh, one of the interesting things that just came out this last week is the CEO of Twitter saying, and I quote, we are, we are the anti-Facebook. Uh, and he points out several, several reasons why Twitter's not going to be like the Facebook IPO. Because they're already focused on mobile. Because they have a strategy for making money. Because they're not going to do that weird thing that Facebook did with their PR agency. You know, they, they have a clear idea of where they want the company to be with this IPO money versus what they say was Facebook's problem of just feeling that they needed to go IPO without actually knowing what they were going to do with that cash. I bring this up at the end of the show because, you know, I, I don't like all the speculation. We know Facebook, I mean, we know that Twitter is going to go IPO. We know that they're going to make a ton of cash. I, I just want to open up to the panel and say, if they open at their target price, which I, I actually can't call up right now. I'm, let's call it 20 bucks. They open at 20 bucks. Is is this a stock that you would actually invest your hard-earned cash in? Do you see enough of a business model there? In, regardless of how important you think Twitter is, do you see it making money enough to justify an investment? I don't buy tech. T I don't buy you tech can't, stocks. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> hypothetically, so if, we were, yeah. if we weren't in the tech industry and if we couldn't get sued by the SEC for hyping know. up stocks that we were going to buy, would you buy? Isn't that so answering that question? Isn't that the reason why we could, you know, get in trouble? I mean, I'm not a journalist, so I could answer it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I look at the the lower thirds on on this show. We have the the website name for most of us, right? We have the website name and the Twitter handle, and that's something that it, it ultimately everyone keeps coming back to Twitter all the time. Mm -hmm. it, I say everyone, uh, the people who are interested in the, these sorts of things. Um, and Twitter has, what is it, 200, 250 million user, users. A chunk of those might be fake users. That's, you know, uh, to be expected. Right. But I have a hard time imagining that a, a, a mode of communication that has that many users, that is so... Uh, ubiquitous now on in every aspect of the, the the in every aspect of the media on tv uh and you know everywhere you see hashtags i have a hard time thinking that this 
thing is not going to end up making money at some point. Uh, it's already making money, but it's not going to end up going up. Um, and it is already seeing nice trends in every metric. Uh, it, it's not Facebook, and some people are failing it, you know, are, are saying that this is a bad thing because it doesn't have the, the Facebook numbers. Facebook numbers are unbelievable. You know, 1.26 mm -hmm. million users. That is not something that you compare your service to because that doesn't that it's unreal but, 250 but can, million users is not something to <laughs> scoff at so but you can compare the fact that when twitter had its ipo it was profitable it, and more importantly it had figured out how to crack uh how to sell to its audience twitter uh i, I i'm sorry I mean, facebook facebook has figured out how to sell and make money twitter has never done that twitter has uh, and it has a, a big problem. For example, that that article that um, uh, you put it in the doc, Padre. But the uh, uh, Twitter's fire hose problem: the fact that the more people join Twitter and the more people you follow, the less valuable Twitter becomes, and the harder it is to sell targeted ads. Uh, it is a real problem, and the fact that last quarter they lost what was it like? The, I, I forget what the number is, but they lost money. Uh, these are big problems going into an IPO. Yeah. Yeah. Last word on Twitter? No? Kind of done with it. I don't know. I, I always thought the whole anti Facebook, maybe I had just haven't read the right article, but it, to me, it seemed like the anti Facebook was Twitter trying to say, you know, if you buy at 38, it's not going to drop 20% before rising 88% like eight months later. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's business speak. It's, it, yeah, yeah, it's Wall Street. Yeah, it's Wall Street. It's a rigged game, man. But you know what's not Wall Street? Tom Merritt with this look at the week ahead. <laughs> hey, thanks, Father Robert. Here's a look at uh, some of the things we'll be keeping an eye on in the week ahead on Tech News Today. Monday, October 7th, MIPCOM kicks off. That's the conference where all the TV show and movie makers get together to try to sell their wares and more web stuff and more web companies have been showing up at that. Wednesday, October 9th is M-Tech from MIT. That's an emerging technology conference. Thursday, October 10th, the Samsung Galaxy Note 10.1 Tablet 2014 edition comes out in the United States. And Saturday, October 12th, Hack 5 releases the next version of its Wi-Fi pineapple in Richmond, California, or live on YouTube. That's a look at the week ahead. Back to you, Father Robert. Thanks, Tom. You know, I want to thank all of our panelists. My gosh, this, this has been a really fast two hours. I just realized we hit two hours. Oh I, want to, I want to thank all of you for giving up a Sunday to to just reminisce with me about the, the tech of the week. Yeah, uh, Patrick, I, I love whenever you're on the Twit TV network. Tell us, where can they find your work and what are you doing? I'm sorry, not Patrick. <laughs> oh, right. I was, I was confused. I was like, he's looking at the screen, but Patrick is right next to him. What's happening? It's complicated, uh, man. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me. First of all, it was it was a blast. Um, I do a bunch of podcasts in French. Uh, the latest of one is called Positron. Uh, you don't say it like this, but it's Positron in French. And uh, we just recommend some cool stuff like uh, movies, TV shows, uh, comic books, books, uh, albums, music, uh, stuff like that. And it's just a, a fun 20 minutes with two friends. And it's really a, a, a joyful show so i encourage if you've been depressed by uh this week in tech and you speak french then go ahead and uh, find it on frenchspin.com and if you want to find more of me uh you will be going to twitter my handle is as you might have guessed not patrick thank not you chad patrick. for the coordinated uh, screen grabs that's that we love we love chad he's he's awesome like that of course you could always find him at patrickbeja.com now, as well. the not not Patrick, does that? Yeah, that's that's right. Is sitting right next to me, <laughs> Patrick Norton. I mean, what what don't you do? You do this week in computer hardware on the Twit TV network. You do Techzilla. Tell us what's coming up. What what are you going to be able to dazzle our viewers with? I'm going to dazzle you with actually a discussion of FreeNAS. Uh, it's coming up next week on uh, Techzilla. We have um, something coming up on HD Nation. Oh, we've got the uh, the. Uh, Sonos Soundbar, we're talking about an HC Nation, which is a show to do with Robert Herron. Robert Robert Nation. Nation. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awful lot of... There's a little autoplay on that mm. website. Sorry about that. Um, and we just, uh, uh, you know, I just did something, and I can't remember what it is, but techzilla.com, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A. And look, you can see the little uh, Discovery Digital Network underneath Revision 3 now. Yay, yay. It's and Veronica Belmont looking sassy yeah, with the yeah. two old guys. 
Oh, we got snubs. We yeah. got we have our sass quotient. <laughs> Speaking of our sass quotient, uh, a sass quotient, a big sass, part of that squatch, squatch, sass, sass, quotient. sass quotient. Big part of that is <laughs> Mr. Just Brian keep Brushwood. With it. Yeah, we'll just roll with it. Well, it, Brian Brushwood, who is our uh, you know he's our resident scam school. Uh, th did you call yourself a jackass once? I can't remember. Uh, it may be in my profile on Twitter, but you'll never find out what my Twitter handle is. In fact, I dare you to find me. I'll bet you can't ever find my Facebook, my Instagram, my Google Plus, or my Twitter. Oh! You Curse yous. Fine. I'm live, and you can find me online, but I'm not going to say how. Audio listeners, you'll have to find it. Boo! I'm ashamed of being me. <laughs> <laughs> and cut. Worst <laughs> lie you've <laughs> ever told me. <laughs> now, you know, I... I I, I want to close out the show, but first, Chad's got to push this button that's going to show you what you missed if you haven't been watching Twit all this week. Previously on Twit, Gizwiz. This is called the Squatty Potty. How's it going back there? Not so good. I'd just like you to test this out here. How's it going for you in there now? OMG Craft. Ice, ice, icicle. Bye, bye, bicycle. Test, test, testing. One, two, three. This week in YouTube. Oh, oh, wait, what? Get out of my camera. Sorry. Are you taking my space? It, it has a screen on the back, but it doesn't allow you to see what's, what? what's on your own what? thing. What? Like, wait I a minute. Wait a second. While I'm taking a selfie. You're but. such a human. All about Android. Chad, what's up? <laughs> hey, um, uh, every nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> iPad today. I can go anywhere. <laughs> And ways to grow, reading rainbow. <laughs> OMG twit. You heard me. Rainbow. A reading rainbow. I had no idea that I was about ready to play. We've just been chat rolled. <laughs> that big thanks to Anthony who edited that, and then I didn't watch it before the that show. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Fantastic. OMG twit. <laughs> uh, Chad, Chad, but before we let you go, we can find you on the Twit TV network. What what are you? <laughs> I guess I guess I uh, I board off all about Android. I host this week in YouTube. I um, also host OMG Craft, and then I do the switching, the video switching for Twit Twig Mac Break Weekly. So that's why I was on all that You're stuff. You're on every. <sighs> The only thing that bummed me out was that uh, that that uh, test 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 one two three bit like. Uh, do you remember what college we we picked that up like? Because you and I were both there at that college when we were touring together, and yeah. somebody did it live, and it blew us away. We loved it. I remember. So yeah, I forget. I completely forget which college we were, but they were testing the mics, and they did that test. Uh, and it is, I have stolen it outright. Like, and I will tell everyone it's plagiarized. I but I do that every single it's time brilliant. that I can. It's brilliant. Oh, okay. yeah, Absolutely that was great. Funny. <laughs> Uh, and, and on that note, I think we have to close out. I, I'm, I'm actually Father Robert. You can find me Mondays he, here on no, uh, tw uh, mm, what shows do I? Twilight, Twilight <laughs> on Mondays at noon. <laughs> and know how at three o'clock on Thursdays. But you know what? Uh, uh, just don't do that. Just go to Twitter and find me, Padre SJ. Follow me, and you'll find all the different places that I pop up on the Twit TV network. Thanks to everyone, especially to to Chad, to Anthony, to Patrick, to Jammer B, to Burke, to our panelists, to Patrick, not Patrick, and some other guy also not named Patrick, <laughs> and to the thousands of people currently in our studio audience, which is fantastic. I mean, I, I haven't seen a turnout like this. In fact, here, let yourself be heard. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they are so coordinated, they speak as if one voice, as Padre. If, as incredible. if one, or maybe, or maybe two. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, and another twit this is, is in the can. Oh, my God.